Hi, greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be in the world today. Um, my name is Rolando Burgos, and I will be the host for this virtual open house session. Before we get started, though, I would like to, to please switch your Zoom app mode to view uh, and to speaker mode. So for that, you can please hover your mouse over the view icon on the top right corner of the Zoom app a window, then click on it, and then click on the speaker option. So that will assure that you have the best viewing experience throughout the whole session. And with that, then I would like to welcome you to the CPES first virtual open house. It's an online recruiting event for masters, PhD students, postdoctoral fellows, and visiting scholars. We are excited, uh, so we've prepared a nice uh, and packed agenda, very dynamic, so we hope that you will enjoy it. And we hope also will shed light into CPES and what we do at the Center for, for, for Electronic Systems, how we do and how we conduct research and who we are. So hopefully at the end of the session, you have a, book, a good picture and a good understanding of what CPES is. Um, as you see the agenda, we'll start first with, by introducing ourselves, and that will follow next. Then we have Professor Borojevic present the CPES history and background, we'll give you a okay, historical perspective of CPES and what's been up to for 41 years now. Uh, then I'll present the CPES organization, going into the structure and operations of the center. And then we have a highlight session of our recent graduates, including a guest speaker that you will hear later. And we'll follow that with a live lab tour. And that's maybe the main session, main aspect today. You will hear directly from the students as they walk through the lab, showing you um, the lab itself and what they're doing, what they're working on. Um, so that will be, again, starting at 9.50. The time is in the uh, universal time um, in UTC minus five. It's 9 a.m. Eastern time in the US. And we follow that uh, by the CPES professors who are present today will be sharing uh, their research background, their interests, what they're working on and what they will continue work in the future as well to describe any positions available, which is maybe the main interest of most of you guys attending today. After that, I'll come back and show you the details of the terms of the offers we make for the contracts for the masters, PhD students, postdocs and visiting scholars. And we'll finish with a pictorial session about on Blacksburg and the Arlington campuses, which is where we are located in Virginia in the United States. And we'll finish with an open session for you to ask any questions that you may still have after participating in today's open house. And we'll be glad to, at that point to um, answer again, any questions that you may have. With that then, I would like to officially welcome you to the first virtual open house on behalf of all the CPES faculty uh, that you see here. Um, I mean, again, my name is Rolando Burgos. I'm a professor at Virginia Tech and the CPES, and I would like then to invite uh, Professor Borojevic to say a few words. Dusan, please. Hello, I'm Dusan Borojevic. I am also professor at uh, Virginia Tech and uh, co-director at CPES. I led the CPES together with Dr. Lee for 20 years. And then he retired. I led it for another five years and then passed uh, the, that to Rolando, who is now leading it. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking to you a little bit more after this uh, about the history of CPES. Uh, glad uh, that now almost 50 of you joined. We really enjoyed that and um, we are really honored by your interest. Thank you. Christina. Hello, I'm Christina Di Marino. I'm an assistant professor at CPES. Um, yeah, I'll share more about um, the work that we're uh, doing and uh, the activities that we have in Arlington uh, later in this session. So thank you for joining. And then we have Chang, Professor Lee. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Chang Li. Right now, I'm a professor in CPES. And also, I graduate from CPES, so later maybe I can give you both the faculty and the student perspective. You know. So welcome, everyone. Professor Liu. Oh, ha hello, everybody. Yes, uh, my name is GQ Lu. I'm a professor in material science and uh, engineering, and also with electrical and computer engineering. Uh, over the last 30 some years, I worked uh, closely with my colleagues in CPES, 
and solving some of the material related issues with power electronics. Welcome. And then we have Vladimir. Hello, everybody. So my name is Vladimir. Uh, I'm the lab, uh, let's say lab manager or, uh, here in uh, Arlington Lab in, uh, uh, you know, cheapest Arlington Lab. Uh, so I'm also uh, a PhD student here working. Uh, so my advisor is Dr. Rorevich, and I'm also, let's say, uh, yeah, research faculty here. Thank you, Vlad. And then uh, we have Professor Zhang. Richard. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Richard Zhang here. Uh, I'm a relatively new professor, but now I'm not really new to CPAS. Uh, actually, I was a, 25 years ago, I was a student of CPAS, a uh, graduate of uh, Dr. Fred Lee and Dushan Borovich. And uh, being in the industry in the senior leadership position on the technology and the business for many years, two years, and come back to CPAS. That, CPS is not only doing exciting technology, but also huge impact on the industry that really is almost like a very strong magnet and come back. It's great to uh, share with you guys my experience at the future of CPS. Thank you, Richard. And then we have Professor um, Legion. Oh, excuse me. Lian. Hi, this is Lian. I'm a research scientist here and I have been with uh, CPAS for one year. It's a great time here. So I uh, welcome everybody. <laughs> and then we have um, Professor Dong is just joining. If you could... Hello, everyone. Yeah, my, my name is uh, Dong Dong. I'm a assistant professor at CPAS. It's really great to uh, meet with you guys today. Thank you, Dong. And Professor Zhang uh, to attend a um, critical meeting, so he was not able to join this morning. He will be participating in the evening session. Um, I believe the same is with Professor No. Uh, and well, all the CPAS faculty that could participate may be joining later today. Well, as you also see, we have an ongoing search, so we hope to have a new professor join us in the fall this year, later in August, 2024. So with that, again, I would like to repeat that our welcome uh, wishes to everyone and thank you so much for joining us today as we go and navigate through this session to showcase and show again what we do at CPES and who we are really so hopefully that will make you uh, provide all the information you need to make an informed decision of where to pursue your grad student your grad studies so with that I will uh, conclude this session and we can continue with Professor Borojevic I will stop sharing now the screen all right, thank you. Okay, uh, hello everyone again from wherever, wherever you are in the world. Uh, again, a great pleasure that so many of you were able to uh, join us in um, showing you what we are and where we are and uh, where we will be going so that uh, we can see if uh, you can join us and share that experience with us. Uh, being uh, the oldest professor now in CPES, who is still a full-time employed, Dr. Lee is part-time employed in CPES and still active. He is the founder of CPES. Um, sorry. Somehow I got to the wrong place. Okay. So Dr. Lee uh, started, uh, came to Virginia Tech uh, in 1977, and his first task was given by the Department of Electrical Engineering. At that time, you wouldn't believe it. They had an electric car at the um, Department of Electrical Engineering, but it was not running. So his first task as a young professor says, okay, go fix that car. So that's what his re first research project was to fix an electric car that uh, there was an ongoing research at that time at Virginia Tech. Uh, he started recruiting graduate students and uh, the group uh, grew. 
uh, significantly at that time, um, the, the projects were beyond the, this electric car, were really focusing on high frequency power supplies, which was the topic of research for Dr. Lee's uh, PhD dissertation. And then there was a significant funding that was received from NASA, National Airspace uh, um, uh, Administration of the United States to work on space power and then continued funding uh, from other agencies and industry, again, on high density power supply or power semiconductor device characterization, even uh, uh, motor drives, as well as fuel cell converters. Um, and uh, in a few years later, after around five years, uh, the Virginia Power Electronics Center was started, which a few years after that was funded by the state of Virginia as a special technology development center that Virginia State wanted to uh, advance uh, uh, research and industry as well as education in that area. But although this is you know, more than 40 years ago, I just want to point out fuel cells are nothing new. Electric cars are nothing new. Actually, our research at Virginia Tech started with these topics. So that's an interesting thing to observe. And then after that funding from the Virginia State, uh, quite a few new professors were uh, hired. Uh, uh, Professor Dan Chen, Vachel Volperian, Bo Cho, Christian Ramung, Bill Stevenson, Ray Ridley. And then in 91, even I joined uh, back um, because I was a graduate student here from 18 in that beginning. And then Professor Alex Huang and Jason Lai. Of all these professors here, only I am still employed a full-time faculty at Virginia Tech. Um, at uh, CPES, uh, the others have uh, either retired or left uh, uh, to pursue other careers. During these 10 years uh, from 87 to 97 roughly, uh, the thing uh, our research expanded uh, still in the uh, space power, um, and then uh, also in the uh, computer powers, in addition to the um, advancements in high density and high frequency integration, as well as um, the power conversion and motor drives. The key point here is that we expanded kind of from typical power electronic circuits and control into the power systems and started going into the packaging. And that really brought us to us a question, what would be the future of power electronics? How we can make it uh, better? Why are we not developing much faster when there is a need? So we thought, okay, the name is power electronics. Can we somehow explain uh, what's our future? And then we looked at the microelectronics, which from invention of the first transistor all the way to microprocessors at that time and even today, is still every a year and a half, the cost of one bit or let's say one transistor cell drops 50% every year and a half. And that was, uh, um, amazing. that has been amazing, the Moore's law. The power systems early on also had their own Moore's law in the beginning of the 20th century. Every year and a half, the cost of power did drop by 5%. Now this is 10 times not as good as a Moore's law for microelectronics, but it was still good. After 70, it slowed much. But we are power and electronics. Are we as slow as power or as fast as electronics or somewhere in between? Probably somewhere in between, but that was the question we asked. And then we had the idea that we have to increase the amount of integration. That was a key difference between power and electronics. Then in microelectronics, there has been a lot of integration. So instead of uh, uh, screwing and bolting up the things by them, so, you know, with screws, bolts, and nuts, can we do integration? And that's how we uh, proposed, and National Science Foundation of the uh, United States decided to fund us. So we wanted to expand power electronics from uh, uh, you know, core areas where it started, applications, motor drives, and power supplies. And then for... Uh, 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 And then uh, uh, semiconductor devices is enabler and it controls uh, how to control that into something else. And that is the packaging. At that time, packaging was something industry knows to do. There is nothing to research there. And integration, that's again, application engineers do that. Uh, that's not for university. And that's what we said, no, we need to change that in to enable the big progress. 
So uh, since no university has it, um, enough you know, knowledge to do all of that together, we formed the alliance of five universities. Virginia Tech was a leader in power supply applications. University of Wisconsin-Madison was a leader in motor drives. And Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute was a leader in power semiconductor devices. University of Puerto Rico, Mayagasa, North Carolina, a and State University were very good also in control and other applications. But none of us really was good in packaging, was even doing it, and the system integration. So we said, let's team together and develop these two areas focused about integration. And uh, since uh, up to that time, packaging was done by industry, and University of Wisconsin and Madison and Virginia Tech had strong industrial programs of already more than 30 companies where we formed uh, this in uh, 98. Uh, we already had uh, almost 80 industry partners uh, who helped us uh, progress. So, and then we added to that, obviously, as universities, education, outreach to around the world and expanding industry collaboration. So this was the research program. The fundamental level, we're working devices, materials, integration, uh, thermomechanical and controls and sensors, trying how to make not integrated circuits, but integrated power electronics modules. That's what IPEM stands for. So we thought we could come up something like integrated circuits, which would then enable us to come up with power conversion systems and have our own Moore's law. So this is a briefly what we did over these 10 years that the funding from National Science Foundation was coming. In the first two years, we kind of established what's the state of the art from the materials and devices all the way to motor drives and power supplies. And then started developing new things like silicon carbide devices. Some of the earliest development uh, in silicon carbide happened in our center. Then a new packaging of without wire bonds, without prospect. The first uh, uh, solutions of that type also happened here. And then also uh, integrated not just power electronics modules, so just semiconductors, but also passives. So that power supply, which has hundreds of components, can come up uh, to be made as a smaller, more dense, and with just a 10 or 12 components. Because all these filters here, for example, are integrated into this single iPad. And all these semiconductor devices here can be integrated into single active IPEM, this one here. So that's how that was the approach that we were demonstrating and then continue with developing new devices. First 600 volts does again for power applications. HEPT was also developed in our center as well as a new nano silver die attached, which are now widely used. Uh, as well as integration into uh, some systems like motors and uh, uh, ballast for um, uh, high density discharge labs or uh, uh, LEDs. And then beyond that, we really says, okay, what about whole power electronic systems? Like in the new aircraft, it is all power electronic systems. Whole power system is power electronic systems or in more or all electric ships. And uh, that's where we are. So today, uh, during that time, we also hired quite a few uh, new faculty. And uh, of these, uh, five are still here. The others, they either retired or left to pursue other applications. And then uh, we developed there the things that I mentioned and uh, went to much higher power and uh, much bigger systems. Uh, so finally, today, you, uh, you've seen on, uh, when we introduced ourselves, all our faculty today, but in the last few years, of these 12 people, uh, we hired quite a few of them, but five already left to pursue other careers, whereas the others are with us. Uh, the biggest thing there was that we moved to higher power and higher power systems, but continued our packaging work and high density integration and power supplies as we did before, but now are pursuing applications all the way to the grid. And uh, Dr. Burgos will now continue uh, telling you where we are and how we are doing today. Thank you, Dushan. Thank you for the background and, and historic perspective of CPES. I will continue now with the overview of the center as it is today. So again, welcome and let's get going. 
as you may know, uh, we're located in Virginia on the east coast of the United States. Uh, Virginia Tech has multiple campuses and the main one is in Blacksburg in Southwest Virginia, but it has expanded significantly all its operations around uh, Washington DC in Arlington, Alexandria, uh, specifically, and we are also located in the Arlington campus with a second lab. And I'll go into more details, of course, about this. Virginia Tech, which you may be familiar uh, at this point if you're considering applying to, uh, to Virginia Tech for grad school. Um, it's currently uh, growing a university. We are up to 37,000 students. I understand the plan is to grow up to 40,000 students of which 20% of the population is grad students. So obviously the remaining is undergraduates. In Virginia Tech is a comprehensive university. We have basically all the fields of knowledge, but law, since law is, is a um, center in the, at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, a few uh, hundred kilometers north from Blacksburg where we are located right now. This slide shows uh, CPS as it stands today. You see the names of all the faculty. You've already met many of them, uh, but maybe just to recap, uh, we have Professor Borojevic, who is also the Deputy Director of CPES, Professor No, Professor Zhang, Professor Li, Professor Lu. Then we have Professor Dong, uh, Zhang, uh, Di Marino, and then Professor Li, who is Director Emeritus and also um, Emeritus University Distinguished Professor, who is still active uh, and, and advising a couple of students. Um, then we have uh, Eric Z and Li and Zhu also as research scientists for working with us. With all, between all of us, we advise approximately 100 students, uh, of which 50 of them are PhDs, um, many are master's students, about 30 of them. Most of them are also on the track to become PhD students, and then several undergraduate students through different projects that we conduct within our department, and also visiting scholars. Uh, who are primarily visiting students, visiting PhD students that come to spend a period of time in the lab. We also have research and administrative faculty, including David Gillum, who is our lab operations director, Ling Lee, our finance director, and Dennis Grove, who is our industrial program director, of, from whom you may have heard about the, the, this virtual open house. And this plot in the bottom shows the number of people, faculty, students, and staff that have been part of CIPA since the big, very beginning when Dr. Lee joined and started the center growing during the VPEC years and then the NSF period, which obviously because of the additional significant additional funds allow us to grow quite a bit. And then those funds taper down. 2008, you may remember or not, or you may have heard maybe you read in your history books about the global recession in 2008 that obviously had an impact. So we had a small dip here as we were graduating from NSF. And since then we've been growing steadily there's some uh, minor impact here due to COVID in 20, uh, but 20, the numbers of 23 point out that we are back to uh, um, a growing path. <clears throat> as in all, a CPS as a center has graduated more than 400 PhD and master's students, which is um, quite important as I'll point out later on. And to give you an idea of the size of our operations, the annual research expenditures are at about um, 11, well, 11.7 million. So that gives you an idea of the size of the research enterprise that is conducted within the center. The center itself is an industry consortium as well as you heard Professor Borojevic in the overview. So we have partners in the power electronics industry from around the world. We have a global footprint really with about half the members in North America, and then the rest distributed between Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. So we work in, and that's also maybe a, a feature of our electronics, that is a field that is developed technically around the world in different aspects, different, um, say, focuses. Uh, but we really work and collaborate with all these companies, and we have partners and friends around the world who makes our work uh, quite enjoyable and, and interesting always. This is a list of all the companies that make the CPS consortium right now. It's changing constantly. So I'm sure it's already outdated because this is a couple of weeks old. And I know yesterday we welcome a new company. Um, but you can see the large number of companies is if you count them up, I think it's 90 at this point. We have 36 principal members, principal, 10 principal members, 36 principal plus members, sorry, then of 28 associate members and affiliate members, this tier. Uh, system of membership obviously gives the uh, companies part that participate different benefits uh, that um, that help them in different ways naturally. In this slide, uh, which you might realize resembles quite a bit the regional um, organization or work topic that the CPS had as an NSF center, 
is built on that uh, concept shows pretty much everything we do that we like to call uh, or describe as working from watts to megawatts really. Since we're not right now, we're really pushing into the tens of maybe even now hundreds of megawatts. Uh, it's built over the technology areas that we address within the center. Starting on the left, you see the power semiconductors and electronic components. And that's a field that has been uh, revitalized now that Professor Zhang joined in 2018. He's a the device physicist. And, but here we welcome the semiconductors, new devices, and also electronics, and electromagnetic components in general. High density integration, which is maybe the main outcome of the NSF time, where packaging and integration were elevated to research, the valid, valid research area for universities to work on. Um, technology areas of EMI and power quality, we have a history of collaboration with the transportation industry, aviation especially, where EMI uh, is extremely important. So we have a long history of working and developing, designing um, power electronics, taking EMI into consideration, modeling and control and power conversion topologies and architectures, which are maybe more traditional fields of uh, work for let's see, academia in terms of power electronics. And also on the right side, you see the high power large system integration, which is where what the PICS shows really how we've been expanding into larger and larger uh, power electronics based systems now, as the grid itself is transforming slowly into one of these, or at least we like to be believe that. Application areas, these are the main ones we work on currently, but of course we address many more, uh, but the main ones are by far uh, vehicular power converter systems. And you see here um, some nice pictures depicting the traction converters that we work on for aerospace, marine applications, automotive, also railway. The point of load uh, conversion, uh, again, some of them, which is one of the main areas that was originally developed by Professor Lee and developed and grown and also was a key focus during the NSF time. And now that now is conducted and led by Professor Chiang Lee, uh, addressing point of load conversion, but also power management for computers and telecommunications in general. And then the power grid and electronic energy systems where we are looking at higher power converters, the grid itself, how it's transformer, how it's transforming before our very eyes uh, every day with the integration of renewable, uh, wind, solar, PV, energy storage, et cetera. And now we're looking at the larger system distribution up to the transmission level and now slowly trying to move to up the way up to HVDC systems. And so really addressing power electronics from a few watts to maybe gear watts in the near future with your help. <laughs> a key feature of the center is that we, we simulate, we design, we build, we test, uh, many times uh, end up breaking many of these converters, but it's a key feature that we're, as a power electronics itself, we're very experimentally oriented. And that's at the, at the, is the essence of the formation that all students receive. And also one of the main reasons why we have a, such a strong collaboration with industry, since industry in general really values and appreciates the, uh, our students when they graduate. And you can check with them later, but most of them decide to leave when they are tired of receiving offers and they finally pick uh, one out of the five or maybe more offers that sometimes they get you know, to see where they would like to go work afterwards. So it's a very strong collaboration that is based and rooted in this very hands-on approach and that we take on power electronics because I think it's a key and we all think it's a key um, aspect of the power electronics field in general. Now I would like to uh, let Professor Chang Li present the work that he's doing between the consortium and power management. Chang, if you like, I can keep the slide and you can keep going. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Randall. Well, hello, everyone. This is Chang Li again. So here we give a quick summary about this uh, PMC group. We call this one basically power management consortium. And then in here we're doing the research in this low power area and it will cover many applications such as this cell phone, laptop, data center, and the high performance computing, and even include the electric vehicle areas. And for the research the topic, you can see I have the list in here and it will cover the application of this wideband gap device such as the GAN nitride and the carbon device. And we're also working on this high efficiency, high density power converter for data center and the telecom system. And uh, we also spend lots of time working on this uh, integrated magnetics, like integrated transformer, integrated inductor for this high frequency converter. And of course we have a control and today we focus on the digital control for this both the ACDC and DCDC stage. And we also have this uh, wire charger program 
for this um, this uh, portable device like cell phone and also including the electric vehicle. And in terms of the, the sponsor, I know you can see all these uh, company is our current PMC members. And these companies, you have some of them are just device component company. They, they can provide uh, this uh, guide nitro device. And some company is a system level company, okay, like uh, Delta. So they are one of the biggest power supply company in the world. And we also have this uh, semiconductor company you know, pro provided this uh, different IC, like the, the Infini, MPS. And if you search the, this company, you can find out they are very you know, global. We have some member in the US, also have some member in the Europe and some member from Asia. Okay, and here just a um, high level summary about uh, the PMC outcome every year. And normally we have 20 students with two postdoc and working together with five faculty. And every year we publish around 20 conference paper, 20 journal paper, and maybe another 15 is in other presentations. And also we try to submit a 10 pattern application every year. And here, just some example about our research work. So we have professor working on this uh, one-band gap device itself. So we have professor Zhang working on this uh, guy nitro device with very novel structure. So you can have even better performance compared to today existing guy nitro device. And then we're also working on the application with this guy nitro device. So we have this high efficiency, high density converter. For example, this 48 volt to one volt converter for this um, supercomputing application. And then we also have this 400 volt to 48 converter with integrated this transforming inductor. So in here, you only see in the middle that one block of magnetic core. So this one will have both the transformer and induct function. So with the help of this integration, we can have very high efficiency and density. And we're also working on onboard charger. So this is one example of 11 kilowatt bi-directional onboard charger for electric vehicle. Also with integrated transformer inductor. Okay, okay that's just a quick summary for the PMC group. If you have any question about this group, you can just feel free to contact me anytime. Okay. Thank you, Chan. Now we have Professor Di Marino will cover HDI. Hello. Um, so I'll just give a quick overview of our high density integration mini consortium. So this kind of builds off of the integration work that Prof uh, Professor Borovich introduced earlier that came out of that um, NSF Engineering Research Center um, the years and work that was done during that time. So um, it covers a wide range of topics. Um, so a variety of kind of uh, looking at uh, advanced materials, looking at advanced semiconductor devices and characterization of those materials, semiconductors, advanced packaging and integration techniques, as well as some thermal management and reliability. Um, so all things that kind of really facilitate and are the building blocks to achieving this high density advanced levels of integration for our power electronic converters. Um, we cover a wide range of power levels, everything from a few tens of watts to hundreds of kilowatt, um, also very wide frequency ranges. Um, and we've also done uh, quite a bit of work in the high temperature um, areas for high temperature applications or for reducing kind of the thermal management system uh, size and complexity as well. And you can see the current members for this consortium at the bottom there. Um, as you saw from PMC, this one also has very similar kind of distribution in the members, everything from um, companies that work on the devices and the semiconductors themselves to the um, automotive companies and system integrators, some aerospace as well. Um, and these are just a few example projects on the top right that just kind of showed some examples over the past couple of years. Um, and now this slide is just showing um, the CPES faculty that are involved in this uh, consortium um, because high density integration is really, you know, integral into everything we do. You see that actually a lot of the CPES faculty, the majority are involved in this consortium um, and the students that are currently um, contributing to this consortium and the research are shown here at the bottom right. And in the center, we have kind of a list of, you know, some of the numbers and um, uh, outcomes from last year. So a lot of patents um, and dissertations, papers, etc. Um, we also kind of will leverage sometimes our government contracts as well, which is shown in the top right. All right. 
Thank you, Christina. I will give you now a brief overview of the third community consortium on wide band of high power conversion systems, HPCS, uh, which is really focused on where we conduct most of the higher power work right now within the center. The main focus areas are wide band based power converter systems and components for grid, transportation and high power applications in general. Uh, but now we have a growing a new topic in area, which is power conversion for electrified grid infrastructure that is being led by Professor Zhang. And you'll hear uh, about that later also by him. The members that you see, you may be familiar, some of these companies are primarily focus more towards the high power end, ABB, Delta, Siemens, Schneider Electric, Rockwell Automation, Tesla. This is not the automotive piece of Tesla, of course, this is the great side of Tesla with energy storage that they also are getting involved uh, uh, presently. And then we have T-Mike and Aurora Flight Sciences as an aerospace company. We collaborate, of course, uh, with many other um, government agencies as well, but also with Dominion Energy, which is one of the largest or the largest utility in the East Coast in the US, the Office of Naval Research, which is ONR, which is the Navy, Department of the Navy, and then the Advanced Research Program Agency, Energy of the Department of Energy, the College of Engineering also supports us, then NSF and the Oak Ridge National Lab, which is located uh, a couple hundred kilometers east uh, west from here in Tennessee. Some of the main outcomes, uh, of course, with the, um, this group are the students that are formed. Many of these uh, students already graduated. This is the outcome from last uh, academic year. So we joined different companies, we maybe be Tesla and a few other ones. Um, some of the key is a uh, technical outcome of the, pro of the consortium as the number of papers you see at the bottom were published last year, 23 conference paper, 19 journals, um, articles, etc. And intellectual property is also a key focus of the consortium work that we conduct. Uh, we've had five patents awarded and submitted one new application and had four invention disclosures presented to our members. And with that, I think uh, I can move on to talk a little bit about this sponsored research that is conducted within the center. Then these are contracts that are established directly with companies or government agencies, so they're not part of the consortium itself, uh, but we execute all these research projects. Um, right now, uh, the last year, we were executing 59 projects, and then the breakdown of these is shown in this pie chart. Uh, you can see in, in the light blue color, the power converter projects, anything what we call low voltage, which is under one kilovolt. Silver presents uh, close to, say, uh, close to 40% of all the activities within the center. Packaging integration in the bottom, this is a yellow uh, slice of pie here. Semiconductor projects, uh, projects and power converters that are rated at medium voltage according to these classifications or anything above one kilovolt. And then grid applications, which is one of the growing areas to, uh, to with high power converters in general, and then educational programs as well. Some of the recent uh, industry sponsors that we've had are shown at the bottom left. You may recognize several, several of these names. Um, and then on the government side, collaborations uh, that we've had with, again, RPAE, the Department of Energy, with NSF, NASA, and the Navy, uh, ONR specifically, and then Oak Ridge National Lab. And this last slide uh, shows the historic record of CIPE, some of the highlights of the main achievements over this now 41 years. Since the center was established as such, um, more than 400 PhDs and master's students graduated, 408 specifically, number of papers, 3,700 uh, papers, thesis and dissertations that have been published, number of dis uh, invention disclosures filed, 363, 160 patents awarded, many of them through the IP sharing program that we have within the center over the last, over the last years. Um, more than oh, approaching now 300 uh, industry members that CPS has had um, through the years, 286, uh, conducting almost, again, close to 1,000 projects uh, with government and in, in industry in general since the very beginning, 975, uh, with a total of uh, more than 177 millions of research funding since the beginning of the center. And with that, um, uh, we'll keep going now with the next session, uh, next session, which is a highlight on our recent graduates, uh, where we have a guest speaker, Dr. Joseph Kozak. But before we uh, invite Joseph to join, I'll just show you some of the graduates from last year, 2023, some of them pictured with their advisors, respectively. You see Shu Wang at the top left, 
uh, that left us uh, last year and went and joined Apple. We have Lakshmi Ravi who went to North Carolina and joined the corporate research at ABB. And Jun Ming Liang who is now with Borg Warner. Uh, Daniel Lester who joined uh, Rocket Automation. Kang uh, Tu who is now with Tesla. Uh, Rui Jing Zhang uh, is a principal system engineer at InnoScience. Then Aishwara Roy, I believe she's the latest one, the late, most recent graduate. Um, now she's an um, application engineer with WallSpeed. Then we have Zijin Zhang, uh, who is a um, principal engineer with microchip technology. Fei Yang Zhu, uh, who, is, who is with monolithic power systems, and Jian Liu, who joined, left uh, also a few months ago and joined Delta Electronics. So uh, with that then, uh, we thought we cannot invite everyone, but we can at least have one of these uh, former students uh, join us today. And Joe Kozak has kindly accepted to participate and join us this morning. So Joe, good morning. If you can unmute yourself, please. Good morning. Can you hear me, Dr. Burgos? We can hear you very well. Thank you so much. So you can, Perfect. I'm sharing your slides so you can take it away. Yeah, I can see it. So hello everyone. Thanks for joining the CPES open house. Um, uh, yeah, th and thank you to the CPES faculty and, and staff for inviting me back to talk. Uh, very excited uh, always to, to share my experiences back from, from Virginia Tech. So um, a little bit about myself. I'm from Lower Marion, Pennsylvania, here in the United States, just outside Philadelphia. So if you're a basketball fan, same uh, same place as Kobe Bryant. I, I did my undergraduate or my bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Pittsburgh before deciding to come to Virginia Tech. Um, so I joined in 2016 through 2021, and it was, uh, it was a, a great couple of years. Uh, despite the small pandemic that was going on through there. Uh, as, as I kind of listed there, while I was at, at Virginia Tech, had lots of great opportunities, got to hang, got to meet lots of, of uh, uh, different students, visiting scholars from all around the world, and had a couple of internships. So, um, sorry if it's a little loud out here. Uh, the conference rooms have been were booked up, so I had to sneak outside. Um, but, yeah, for, by... By the work that I was doing, which is focused on reliability of wide band gap devices, got to go all around uh, the United States for different internships uh, at uh, the National Re Renewable Energy Laboratory, Wolf Speed, and then NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And that last one ha has kind of helped or influenced um, me getting involved in the aerospace industry. So uh, since graduating about two years ago, I should also probably comment, I was under the advisement of doctors. Uh, Yu Hao Zhang and uh, Dr. Kai No. So they were both fantastic advisors supporting me. And now I'm at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. So we're here on campus now. Um, and I'm a senior staff member and the chief technologist for the Spacecraft Power Engineering Group. So looking at what these new technologies are, always trying to keep uh, an eye on, on what CPES is doing and in, uh, in, uh, inventing. Um, in terms of uh, help that we can can help grow our projects. One is the NASA Dragonfly project, trying to build a drone to fly around Titan, one of the moons of Saturn. And I am also helping support to look at what the power grid on the moon will look like, our moon that is. So that that's a little bit about uh, myself and, and uh, CPES is, is one of the pillars of, of how I got here and, and my whole career, so. All right, and Joe, thank you very much to, for the background. I stopped sharing your slides and now people can see you close up. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to ask you if you could share with us, how do you, what do you really like? As you mean, you like something about CPIS and also about Virginia Tech, if you could share that with us. Yeah, uh, so so I, I was at the Blacksburg campus. Um, that was certainly, uh, it, it's certainly one of the most beautiful campuses I've, I've found on in the United States. Um, while it is a little bit remote for some people, living in the city now is, is a bit of a change, but it's, it's certainly, if you like nature and, and hiking and, and getting outdoors, it's a great way to, to recharge um, and uh, in between working on, on all of the uh, projects and, and uh, your, your normal assignments. Um, so that, that's something, at least for Virginia Tech. Uh, Virginia Tech also offered a lot of different kind of great uh, opportunities to grow and expand outside of CPES itself. Uh, so um, I'm trying to think uh, great ways to get involved in volunteering, 
develop your other interpersonal skills, uh, develop other hobbies. So the overall area and university is, is I think, great. Um, and then I, I think you, I, CPES itself is, is one of the most unique places you can go and study where it's, um, there's 50, 60 students all around you working towards the same uh, problem. I think it was actually Dr. Burgos, one of the comments you wrote or you, you gave me when I first started was there was almost never a time where you can focus and learn so much about something and really build your technical skills up because now I have to write reports all the time. So it's it's uh, not nearly as much fun or Excel sheets instead of being in the lab, soldering, designing circuits, um, blowing semiconductors up. So it's it's a pretty unique place. Thank you, Joe. Maybe just to finish, what, uh, how do you think CPES help you in what you're doing now and your job <laughs> that you started? I, I don't think I could do my job without CPES at this point, um, to, be, to be frank. Uh, CPES is a unique institution where, and I think between what Professor Boryevich showed and what you've showed is, you have almost a monopoly of the power kind of architecture from material or my, my committee itself included people from materials, semiconductors, packaging into converters. So you, you're looking at a full vertical integration of technology. And I don't, I, there are maybe only a, a, a few of those locations around the world um, with that capability. And I don't know if any of them are as integrated or as cohesive as CPES. So to me, doing my job, uh, I don't think it, it would be possible without having learned from all those steps, especially for, for high reliability applications, trying to figure out what materials we can put on the moon, what can go towards Saturn, very interesting challenges, look at what circuits are, are better. So looking through the whole trade-offs, it's, it's a unique place uh, to, to be able to learn and study um, all of the facets that are involved in the power industry. Thank you, Joe. Very, uh, very insightful, very humbling from our side to hear that you're, you're pleased like that. Because, well, anyways, we really appreciate your, <laughs> your input. Thank you. Glad to see you again. And we'll see you maybe later today again, correct? So, yep, Joe, we see you have a minute. Uh, do we ever did any parties? This is Dushan talking. Or we just work uh, uh, oh. 24 hours a day. Or maybe we have two hours for parties. So, so it depends on on who's around but i i we we work really hard but we have a lot of fun i think part of my one of my favorite things about cpes is the people so um yeah my my old roommate for 3 years was was also a cpes student was was professor boryevich and professor uh, burgos's student so he he and i would would host some gatherings um everyone was invited uh, and we used to to be able to enjoy ourselves and and the student council that is involved with the the the, the uh, kind of promoting the student perspective towards the faculty uh, did a very nice job I thought as well on promoting some of the the extra or like the the whole experience of being a student so getting outside getting in like getting to know your your peers getting to be able to um, kind of experience the rest of the university. So while you may spend maybe a majority of your time in the basement of Whittemore or in the Arlington lab, there's a lot of uh, chances and a lot of ways to also experience the rest. So you can Thank have you. some fun too. Thank you, Joe, appreciate your time. Yep. And we'll see you later today. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Go Thank Hokies. You. Thank you. All right. Ladies. Let's continue now with the next portion, um, screen three. All right, so we'll start now with the virtual lab tour. This is a, a discussion of, of the CPES Research Laboratories and Electrical Power and Packaging and Integration. And before we kick, uh, kick off this section, I'll show you just briefly uh, our labs uh, in this uh, one slide. Uh, so we have about 21,000 square feet, which is almost 2,000 square meters 
collapsed space, an office space in Blacksburg and Arlington, you know, in the Washington DC area, as you already heard. The picture on the left is Whittemore Hall, and that's where I'm sitting, somewhere on the sixth floor. We also have the packaging lab on the sixth floor, and the main electrical power lab is in the ground level behind this uh, stone walls, all the pretty much the whole first floor of this building. You can see some pictures here in the lab, different areas of the lab that you will see next as we are, as our students will walk you through it. And on the right hand side, you see a picture of the Virginia Tech Arlington campus, uh, where the lab is on the fourth and fifth floor in this case. You can see some images here as well, but again, you'll see much better perspective as we go next. This lab is, was inaugurated in 2018. Um, that was after uh, Professor Borayevich's initiative to start the center and expand our presence in, the, in this region where Virginia Tech is also growing. Um, and we had then an expansion thanks to Professor Di Marino. She added a new packaging and integration lab that started in January last year, to about two years ago. And then we just finished uh, of a little after uh, Thanksgiving in, in November the 2023, the expansion of the electrical lab, which pretty much doubled its capacity now, will be able to host 17 students in the environment that you see here. And that was uh, the work of Professor Zhang, who is also located in, in Arlington, and it helped expand this our facilities and capabilities in the region. So with that, I would like to now hand over the, the presentation to level stop sharing. So we can watch then the tour by Bo Lee, who is in one of the area lab area leaders that we have. And Bo Lee, are you ready? I will stop my video now. All right. All right, there you go. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Bo Lee. I'm a uh, senior PhD student here at CPAS. Uh, I will lead today's lab tour uh, for the CPAS lab. So starting from the gate, we will see, entering from the gate, we will see the uh, the shelves that displays um, each, every converter that has been designed by CPAS. So we have all kinds of converters. Uh, as talked about by the previous professors, we have the uh, different converters for uh, air, mm, aircraft applications, for Navy applications, all kinds of high power converters. And we also have some uh, converters that's for the low power, like charger applications, data center applications, as we see from here, uh, just trying to improve the power density of all these kinds of uh, converters. Uh, so here we have the meeting room when, where we can have uh, research meetings and also some uh, any academic discussions here. And we also have a computer lab here, which can uh, have where we can have some uh, sim uh, simulations and trying to uh, utilize the uh, high computing um, capability of this computer lab. And then going forward, we will have the CPAS lab with the each bench assigned to each of the students. So we have John Wei here. Hello, John Wei. Yeah, and we have all kinds of uh, different students here. So ac actually each bench, we have a uh, power supply, we have oscilloscopes, uh, multimeters, all kinds of equipment that you need to conduct your research and doing some tests. So, and then going forward, we have some, uh, the as you can see from here, we have all the sponsors that sponsor CPAS. Uh, so yeah, different uh, sponsors, companies. So here we have Raj here. Hi Raj, how are you doing? Good. So what are you doing here? Uh, all right, uh, so my name is Raj. Uh, I'm one of the graduate research assistants here. I'm a master's student in my second year. Um, and I'm currently working uh, on uh, magnetics. So uh, my research is focused on magnetics. Uh, we have a very cool project uh, that's funded by uh, the Department of Energy, uh, and I'm also part of the HDI consortium here in CPES. Um, so, uh, as Bo showed you, we uh, we have very cool a uh, very cool space here to work. Uh, most of the time, we um, or all the time, we really have uh, everything we need uh, right here at our bench. So, for example, um, he showed you the uh, function generators, the DC supply, the oscilloscope we have. Uh, and the computers now uh, on the computers we 
usually work with um, the most recent software. So it's, um, uh, for example, this is just the CAD modeling software. We have uh, lots of 3D uh, and 2D simulation softwares like ANSYS that are heavily used in the industry. Uh, so you really get to uh, train on, on things that uh, will be helpful to your future career uh, and will directly, uh, you'll be ready for the industry, let's say. Um, so for example, um, this inductor is, is uh, one we're testing for uh, this project that we're working on. Um, I have this board that I ordered uh, from funds um, that are available from CPS and the project. Um, and I can test it right here at my bench. Uh, I can provide the signals from my function generator, the power from my DC power supply, and then I can read everything using scopes on the oscilloscope. Um, and then if I need something else, then there are uh, very big equipment that's uh, shared between all of us because it's much more expensive, like this DC power supply, for example, uh, or impedance analyzers. Uh, so these are always available to you. Um, so you really can do a lot just right from your bench. Um, so yeah, thank, thank you for joining this uh, tour and I hope you uh, enjoy it. And thank you, Raj. To meeting you. Yeah. Yeah, so I think this is the end of the uh, lab tour for the low power area. Then I will hand this lab tour to uh, Zhe Qin, uh, who is a senior, also a senior guy here. And yeah. Hi, Bo. Uh, thanks for the introduction, everyone. Uh, this is Zhe Qin, and I'm the area leader for the low power two area. Just in this area, just we are almost all supervised by Dr. Changli and Dr. Bradley. And just for here, just we are working on this kind of what we call so-called low power applications, just from the range of this kind of hundreds of watts to this kind of hand to this kind of multi kilowatts. So for example, like around 20 to 30 kilowatts. And that is what we may call at this moment, this kind of low power applications in this kind of electric vehicle and maybe this kind of data center applications. And if we just take our uh, take our run look at just everyone here, just we are all working pretty hard just in this region, and just almost everyone is here, uh, except some students uh, who is still having meeting with their uh, their advisors and these kind of sponsors. And here, just uh, here is Shin, and he's working on this kind of loop of pure uh, application with this kind of high power density single stage. Uh, uh, 40, 48 volts to this kind of one volt voltage regulators. And here is Addis, and he's also working on such a PLL applications. Hi, Addis, could you please just to uh, give us a brief introduction on your work? All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Addis Dira. Uh, I'm mainly working on the CPU application. So, after you know, you all, maybe you all guys use uh, ChatGPT, and ChatGPT is powered by a processor, normally a GPU like this. So in this processor, we have a buck converter to power this processor. But for the challenge right now for the AI application, the current is very high. So we need to make the buck converter right now is very small. So here we just show the latest industry product, which is uh, have a good size, but the height is not good enough for this AI application. Therefore, this is our proposed solution. Basically, we reduce the height from around eight millimeter to four millimeter, doubling the power density. So maybe as a perspective, this is kind of like, take a look at this very small uh, comforter, which uh, we built by ourselves and then we tested on the uh, evaluation board shown like this. And so yeah, that's all from me, Zuching. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Edish. And as you may see here, we have just plenty of this kind of testing equipment, including this kind of scoop and also this kind of auxiliary power supplies. And as you know, just we have this kind of multi-phase guys, and so so we have we, we still have need to a lot of this kind of auxiliary power supplies and also some kind of current sensors, as you may see here. And if we just continue go around, the, the maybe we can say here 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 is Taylor and just working on this kind of EMI is stuff, and he here have this kind of fancy kind of automatic, this kind of uh sort of things to to measure this kind of EMI stuff. Yeah, my stuff and here is Pranav. He's working still work, working still with this kind of next generation power delivery, vertical power delivery system for this kind of GPU applications. And here is Xingyu and Gimbom as they are working on this kind of inverter-based converters, and which is for this kind of electric vehicle applications. 
And if we just continue to move around, the, the, this region are, are mostly the, the DC, DC guys working in this kind of electric vehicle areas. And here is Fengjin and Chunyang and also Ali. And they are all working with this kind of you know, high, power, high power from this kind of uh, six kilowatt to like around 30 kilowatts uh, resin converters with this kind of regulation purpose. And just if we continue to look around, here is the, the high power bay in our area. And as we may know, this kind of it will be a little a little bit dangerous if we just uh, to, to, to just uh, increase the power to this kind of tens of kilowatts. We, which means we have some kind of safety solutions and we, we have to just, just, just do the experiment inside this kind of bay. And uh, we'll, when we run the converter, everyone should stay out and to use this kind of remote control. As we may see here, we, we, we still have this kind of plenty of this kind of testing equipment, including this kind of AC source, DC source. And also here, we may see some kind of the electric loads and also this kind of power analyzers inside. And just also we, we, we have such a kind of eight channel uh, uh, scope that we can use inside in this kind of region. If we continue to, to go to this kind of high power bay, what, what we will see is kind of the, how much patent, how, how many patent we have here. And if we just, maybe we can specify on, on just one of this kind of patent and who is guaranteed to Dr. Fredley and we with this kind of the, the, the circuit pack, uh, circuit topologies and also the, the, the detail for this kind of pattern. If we see from the other side, we may see this is also the world's fastest switch in 1980s and here how huge it is, but, but we, we may see just how, how small the switch is in, in, our, in our recent years. And if we just continue to here and I will just, um, Matthias will take over my work and he will just give you an introduction for this kind of high power area. Thank you, Siqing. Hello, my name is Matthias. Uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student advised by Dr. Burgess and the air leader for high power one. Um, as we moved in from low power to high power, we increased in the voltage level and also then the power range of our converters. Uh, the highlight of the high power one area, if I may switch the camera, is our EMI chamber that allows us, which is fairly, it's unique for a university setting, um, to have an EMI chamber then within the lab. Um, within the EMI chamber, we were able then to um, evaluate the that our, um, Sitching, your microphone is still on. Within the uh, EMI chamber, we test um, our converters uh, for the electric and electric interference, as well as then our uh, high power and high medium voltage converters uh, for their um, capabilities of handling high voltages. So all our medium uh, converters are designed then with uh, PCB bus bars and we test then um, the PCBs and then within the EMI chamber then if they're able to withstand uh, such high voltages up to 20 kilovolts. We also have then a uh, vacuum chamber within the EMI chamber that allows us then to emulate in high altitude uh, conditions as we have uh, a good amount of projects then for the aviation industry and at high altitudes, the PCBs have to uh, experience them a different uh, breakdown voltage. Um, so therefore, we have them to test then our inverters then as well uh, at, at lower vacuum. If we then move them through the lab, we have in total 11 students in the high power one area. Uh, one of the students is uh, Qingling. She is a fifth year PhD student advised by Dr. Burgess. And uh, she will then introduce her work. And with that, uh, you can start, Ching. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ching Ling. Uh, so my research focus is modeling, control design, and stability analysis of electronic systems. Yes, at CPAS, I have had the opportunity to contribute to several industry-sponsored projects. So for example, one of this project is uh, sponsored by Google. Uh, which is about uh, a research on uh, data center stabilities. And these are the 
uh, single phase P uh, PFC converters a prototype developed uh, for some uh, experimental verifications in these projects. Uh, and this is the synchronous generators, uh, which has been used as a power source to study the interactions between, uh, say, uh, backup generators and uh, uh, power supply loads in the data centers. So throughout this project, I have the uh, opportunity to uh, dive into theoretical research and develop a uh, converter prototype to uh, enhance my hands-on experience and also publish uh, uh, papers in conference and journals. And at the same time, uh, I was able to be build up a variable connection with the industrial. And for example, I have had the opportunity to uh, intern uh, in uh, at Google's. And moving forward, this is an um, impedance measurement union developed by CPES over the 2010s. Um, so it is used to measure uh, the impedance of converters with an AC terminals. Uh, so impedance is a very important information in stability analysis of electronic system. And this equipment has been used in many uh, modeling and stability analysis works that uh, was published by CPES. So that's all I'd like to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. With that, we're then almost concluding then the two or three hyper one. Uh, we additionally have then our test space. So we test in our converters within the test space and the students are sitting then outside of the test space to keep the students safe. Um, with that, I will then hand over uh, to Min Now. He is the air leader uh, for high power two. Thank you. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to High Power 2. So this is the highest voltage and highest power area in the lab, testing up to 30 kilovolts and several megawatts of power. So we're going to take you through the area. Uh, so as you can tell, as you've seen throughout this lab tour already, well, this is a very open and collaborative environment. Uh, the students are always working together, always discussing their research and sharing their expertise with each other. I think that's really nice, especially if you are a newer student, we'll always pair you up with some senior student to kind of help you along with your master's or PhD journey. So in the high power area, we work on a wide range of topics from high power traction inverters, uh, electric vehicle onboard charging, all the way up to, you know, multi kilovolt MMC converters to interface with the uh, grid, for example. Also in the high power two area, we have a uh, machine shop over here for the students to use to create whatever they need to create for their projects, as you can see. And then similarly to what Matias showed you in the high power one area, in the high power two area, we also have two uh, testing bays where we control all the power electronics uh, safely from outside at our computer stations. So let's go take a peek into one of these testing bays. So as I mentioned previously, in this high power two area, we work on a wide range of topics, you know, grid power electronics. Uh, we have some high power uh, aircraft inverter in the corner over here. Some EMI studies being conducted for uh, automotive applications, as well as, as I mentioned previously, our high voltage MMC work. In this area, we have a total of uh, 25 students. I want to take you over to meet one of our star players, uh, Ash Khan, who's advised by Dr. Burgos. Hello, everyone. My name is Ash Khan, by star. I'm a second year PhD student at CPES, and my advisor is Dr. Burgos. I currently work on two projects sponsored by Office of Naval Research and also Newport News Shipbuilding. And here at High Power 2, we work on uh, both in terms of research and power. Hardware, we work on medium voltage high power converters. And here in the bay, here is an example of that. Set up for testing. This is called PEP 6000, which is a power electronics building block. Um, this is a full bridge converter by itself, uh, which enjoys 6 kV DC bus voltage and 1 megawatt output power with switching frequency of 10 kilohertz. Uh, <clears throat> Except for 10 kV, uh, very fast switching speed SIC MOSFET power modules, uh, all other sub circuits like PCB bus bar, gate drivers, auxiliary power supplies, and controller, they are all uh, designed, built, and tested by CPES students. As said, uh, this is a full bridge converter by itself and is capable of DC DC or DC AC or AC AC operation. But these converters are intended to be stacked in series or in parallel to form modular multi-level converters. 
And here we have an example of a modular multi-level converter, uh, which is a 24 kV, 2 megawatts SIS MOSFET based MMC, which is built out of 16 power electronics building blocks. These building blocks are similar to what you've just seen, but um, they still have 6 kV DC bus voltage, but they are rated at 500 kilowatts uh, each. So out of 16, 6 kV, 500 kilowatts uh, building blocks, we have a 24 kV, 2 megawatts MMC. And in terms of research, when we have an MMC, there are two issues that are mo not modular by nature, although each of the converters are modular. The first one is insulation. So when we have a 24 kV MMC, the insulation of each converter should be designed for 24 kV. And other than that, uh, another issue is electromagnetic interference. So we, we, uh, in terms of research, we are trying to model the common mode uh, noise propagation path inside each converter and also the cross stack between PEP units when they are stacked in series or in parallel. Because when we have an MMC at the end, uh, uh, rating and capability per PEP ultimately depends on the voltage, current, power, and the switching frequency of the whole converter assembly. So this is what we are studying in terms of research and in terms of hardware. Um, we design boards, we test boards, and try to integrate systems to build a uh, converter itself and also the MMC as a whole system. All right, thanks Ashkan. So that wraps up in Blacksburg. So as you saw, we have a wide range of topics that we work on. Uh, we're really excited to have you guys here in the future. And now I want to pass it on to our facility in Arlington, Virginia. Hello, everybody. My name is Narayan Rajagopal. I am a graduate student in uh, CPES. I'm actually calling in not from Blacksburg, but from Arlington, Virginia. Um, so in Arlington, Virginia, which is part of the greater Washington, D.C. metro area, we have two labs, one an eligible lab and one a packaging lab. So I'll show around the packaging lab facilities that we have here um, that was opened um, in um, mid-2022. And we have a sister packaging lab in Blacksburg that was opened um, several years before that. So maybe as a quick back, uh, just on packaging for those not familiar with it. So here's an example of a package that we built here at CPES. Um, so inside the package, we have these little squares, which are the semiconductor devices that do the switching that turn on and off. And we work on the mechanical structure of this package, figuring out the layout design um, to basically improve power density, electrical performance, improve reliability. So it's a very multidisciplinary um, type of work. And that makes CPES a sort of very uniquely vertically integrated lab since we're able to do everything from the packaging level that goes inside the converter and then onto the system level. So to be able to do this, we have very um, a lot of specialized pieces of equipment. I'll show around the packaging lab here. So here um, on my left is several ovens, hot plates, um, lamination tools that lets us do high temperature processing of materials. Panning over, we have um, tools to do logical characterization of the packages we build, as well as material processing of things like encapsulants and silicone gel. Panning further over here, we have several tools that allow us to do reliability testing, as well as thermal testing. And a key feature of our lab is we fabricate everything that we uh, build and test here. So many of the several important pieces of equipment include this, which is a wire bonder. So this helps make the electrical connections inside of a power module using aluminum wire. Um, and after you do that, you have a chance to observe your package under a microscope since everything we do um, tends to be a little bit small. And this allows us to see very high quality pictures of what we're working on. For example, here, this is a 10 kV silicon carbide die. And here we're carefully placing different metal posts on the device to do sort of uh, wire bondless interconnect designs uh, to improve electrical performance and thermal performance. To be able to do this, we have some specialized pieces of equipment. For example, here, uh, this is called a die bonder. So this has specialized heads and tools that allows you to carefully 
pick and place different types of materials using this arm um, and carefully picking and placing um, devices um, and substrates and um, other interconnects as well. Uh, moving on further, so this is a piece of equipment that we have to do thermal characterization. Like I previously mentioned, where we do a lot of multidisciplinary work in this lab, um, not just the electrical aspect, but also the thermal aspect. So this better helps us understand the thermal performance of our package and how it would behave inside of a converter uh, that we would uh, run. And then back here is a reliability test here. So we use this to essentially do destructive tests. So once you design your package, you build your package, test your package, um, you basically want to destroy your package to see um, what are the weak points, what could be improved further. And this machine allows us to do that. Panning on to the left, we have a lot of hot plates, lasers, and 3D printers that we use to um, fabricate all of our module work as well. Here, I'll highlight some of our packaging work that we've done in this lab at CPES. On top here, you see a double-sided cooled module that was built here for the Department of Energy. Um, and this, again, goes back to the focus on really improving the power density and the thermal performance challenges that comes along with increasing power density. Going a little bit further down, this was a uh, package for high voltage uh, applications, so 10 kV um, modules. And this was uh, done as part of the HDI mini consortium. On the bottom here, this is sort of packaging large area planar substrate uh, modules for the Office of Naval Research. So being up in Northern Virginia, we do a lot of work um, for governments and industries that are located in this um, important part of the country. I'll also pan over to talk to Jack Knoll, who is a graduate student here, to talk a little bit about his work um, and his research. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jack Knoll. Uh, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us virtually here at the Arlington Labs. Um, and I wanted to take a few minutes just to highlight some of the packages that have been designed, built, and tested here at, uh, uh, at CIPAS. Um, so I'll start with these two packages here. Um, so these packages are built with 10 kV devices. Um, so we get to work with really high, uh, high voltage devices, um, devices that are on the cutting edge of research, um, and, and take those and package them directly. Um, that's really a unique opportunity to CIPAS. Uh, a lot of the of other labs don't get access to, to devices at that level. Um, and we're able to take those, successfully package them, and, and test them. Um, so moving on, uh, this is the work that I'm currently uh, uh, doing uh, uh, here at CIPA. So um, this is related to uh, the project, if you recall Raj talking earlier about an RPE project that he's involved with. Um, this is related to that project, whereas he's working on the magnetics, uh, I'm working on the package, uh, designing, uh, fabricating, and testing the package, and then uh, hopefully eventually integrating it into the, uh, the, the uh, converter, uh, the system. Um, and that kind of really highlights a, another unique aspect of, of working here at CEPA is you get to work uh, with a lot of engineers with different backgrounds um, and really work on a, a multidisciplinary project uh, that's highly integrated and, and uh, you know, starts from the component level and works all the way up to the converter level, um, which is a very unique experience, I think, to CEPA's um, and, and is very valuable. Great, thank you very much, Jack. Um, switching over. So thank you, everybody. Um, hopefully you got a chance to look, uh, get a sense of what packaging is, the integration work we do at CPES. And um, yeah, we continue to grow our presence in Northern Virginia. I will pass this along, uh, pass this to our electrical lab downstairs with uh, Hassan, who will talk a little bit about our main facility um, in Northern Virginia. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is He Song, and I'm a senior student working in the CIPAS Arlington lab. So right now I'm studying at a, I'm studying at a corridor right outside the lab, but uh, actually you can see the lab through this glass wall. So uh, actually this lab is pretty new um, because it was just opened a couple of years ago, but uh, it is growing very fast. As mentioned by Dr. Burgos, uh, our lab just finished the construction and right now it, it, it was expanded to uh, twice as it, it, it was, as big as it was. So right now, at this moment, this part of the lab looks pretty empty, but uh, it will be filled with uh, new benches um, pretty soon. And on this side, we have these offices for the CPAS Arlington um, faculty members. So right now, uh, let's go inside the lab and I'll show you around.
So right now we are standing inside the CPAS Arlington lab. Uh, as you can see, those are the new glass benches, which looks pretty fancy. And uh, the equipment on the benches are very new and up to date. And on the other side is uh, the uh, storage cabinet. And those are the uh, uh, display cabinets, just like just similar with the one that you just saw in Blacksburg. And uh, right now there are 12 students working at this lab at this moment, and uh, quite a few of them are working on packaging projects. For example, Jack was the, the uh, guy that just talked uh, in the previous lab, and this is Mark. He is working on integrating everything inside the cable, which looks pretty um, uh, impressive. And uh, there are other students working on uh, some other different stuff. For example, uh, this is where I, I sit and I'm, I'm working on EMI uh, topics and some other students work on projects related to power grid. So uh, Harris, would you like to say something? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Harris. Uh, I'm originally from Karachi in Pakistan. I'm a student of Dr. Richard Zhang and I'm here working on uh, power electronics and power systems. And so basically this is a project that we have sponsored by the Department of Energy. And this is a unique project because uh, we get to work with different national labs that are uh, partners in this, uh, in this project. So all of those technology uh, experts from those national labs along with the companies, we get to work with them. And so basically this project is about microgrid building blocks. And what we intend to do here is, uh, as you know, a microgrid is basically an interconnection of uh, different sources and resources. And now with all of the renewables and with the transformation of the grid, we have a lot more power electronics in the grid. So that begs the question, how do we actually control all of the power electronics in that, uh, in that microgrid system? And so that's the exact question we are trying to solve. How is the microgrid bus actually formed, supplied, controlled, and protected? And uh, we think what we can do is we can actually standardize how power electronics uh, should be controlled in the microgrid so that we have a standardized set of control interfaces uh, and the control functionalities that can be used to form a, a microgrid that is almost you can plug and play all of the power electronics blocks together and they can form a microgrid. So this is one of the unique projects that involves a lot of uh, uh, different partners and uh, I'm, I'm really uh, proud to be working on such a project. It's a really great experience to, to be here at CPA. Thank you. So uh, let's move on. So this is Taha, and he will give you a short uh, introduction in test bay. And uh, um, as I said before, this is the lab that we just um, expanded. So right now it looks pretty ample, but it will be filled with uh, seven new benches um, very soon. And here's the test bay area. So uh, the test bay is very similar to what you just saw in Blacksburg, but it has its unique capabilities. For example, the huge cabinet units in the middle is called Axton. So it is a it, uh, it is a power hardware in a loop emulation um, um, test bench. And with it, you can do a lot of uh, um, um, uh, high power um, tests. So uh, right now, Taha is working inside the test bay and uh, let's look at what he is doing. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Taha Moaz um, and I'm working, I'm a PhD student, PhD student working at a doctor to study Marino um, in the field of power tourist packaging. Um, so during my time over during my time in CPS, I had a I had the opportunity to work with multiple industry and academia based sponsors, um, industry based uh, and industry based sponsors, which has allowed me to develop strong theoretical backgrounds and uh, strong theoretical backgrounds and uh, and and an, and an important engineering engineering skills and hands on experience, which is important, which is necessary to succeed in any industrial industrial academia based environment. I have also had the opportunity to network and uh, connect with multiple industry based sponsors. Um, the project I'm working on is a project funded by the Office of Naval Research, um, by the Office of Naval Research um, for future electric ships. Um, this is an initial prototype of that pro of the other project, and the project basically involves building a lightweight, highly powered, highly powered dense, um, state of the art power tonics converter um, for the, for future electric ships. Um, this is the initial prototype, um, and the final prototype basically requires having no jumper wire, having none of these connecting jumper wires, and fit two of these converters into a single um, small um, box of this size. Of this size, um, so and this would require developing uh, developing a, a multidisciplinary core design methodology in order to optimize the electrical, thermal, and mechanical performance of the converter. 
Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I think that's it for uh, the labs for this lab. So I'll uh, hand over to Dr. Burgos. So uh, see you. Thank you, Hesong. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for all the students who presented and shared what they're working on right now. Really appreciate it. I hope it helped the audience as well get a better understanding of everything that is going on in the lab as well as actually seeing the facilities as if you were walking through it. So thank you again, everyone. We'll continue now with the next section of the uh, in the program, which is the um, um, profiles by the CPS faculty. And the first one to present will be Christina. So Christina, if you could go ahead, please and share your screen, and then we'll continue with the set order. So every, everyone should be sharing their own screens right now. Thank you, Christina, go ahead, please. Great, thank you very much. Um, so hello, um, hello again. Uh, so I'm Christina DiMarino. I'm an assistant professor at CPES. I also uh, have gotten my master's and PhD degrees from CPES as well. So I've been at CPES now for about 10 years or so. Um, I work uh, primarily on power electronics packaging and integration. Um, so uh, we, you saw the packaging labs um, from uh, Narayan that we have in Arlington. We of course also have packaging labs in Blacksburg as well. Um, just a little background on packaging. Narayan mentioned that it's very multidisciplinary. So there are, yes, there are a lot of electrical topics that need to be considered, um, but also it's uh, a lot of uh, reliability topics, uh, mechanical topics, thermal, et cetera, um, and materials and processing, of course, as well. So kind of what's the role of the package? I wanted to kind of quickly highlight that. So it provides mechanical um, and environmental protection for the semiconductor devices. Of course, it has to provide the electrical signal and power distribution and maintain signal and power integrity. Um, and then the thermal management, it needs to dissipate the heat from the semiconductor devices. Um, so I'll just kind of quickly go through some example packages uh, that we uh, have built in the CPES labs. Um, I wanted to start just by highlighting kind of the advanced power semiconductor devices that have been coming out over the last 10 years or so. Um, so with gallium nitride and silicon carbide devices, they have you know, much better performance overall compared to silicon. And our packages are needing to then kind of keep up. Our packages now have um, more um, uh, stronger requirements when it comes to electrical performance, thermal performance, and reliability. Um, and so that's kind of the aim of our research is to develop these packages for these advanced and up and coming wide band gap and ultra wide band gap devices so that we can bring out these key benefits offered by these devices. And so these are just a few examples of some high power, high voltage, high temperature, high frequency packages that we've been working on. Some are through uh, government contracts, some are with industry. And um, kind of some of the, the, each of these benefits kind of course correlates to a particular research challenge or challenges that we kind of really make work on addressing. So the high current density of these devices results in very high heat flux. So we do a lot of advanced thermal design um, and thermal analysis for the packages and different cooling methods, such as this one that's a double-sided jet impingement cooler, which you saw um, when you went through the lab tour. Um, also, when you have higher voltage devices, you have more electric fields. You saw from Matthias in the lab in Blacksburg that uh, we have uh, lots of insulation testing capability to test partial discharge and test part partial discharge um, also under like high altitude type conditions for aviation. Then, um, you know, as applications are requiring kind of more extreme temperature environments for the electronics, then the reliability can suffer. Uh, so we work uh, with advanced materials, as Professor GQ Liu will mention, um, related to both the voltage as well as to, um, you know, higher reliability, high temperature materials um, that can enable, um, you know, harsh environment electronics while maintaining the, the lifetime required for the application. And then, of course, when we have very fast switching speeds, now EMI becomes more challenging. So, um, you know, a variety of faculty at CPES all work towards EMI at kind of different um, aspects of the converter. Um, I kind of work on it when it comes to the package. How can we lay out the package um, or have kind of additional components within the package to help mitigate the amount of EMI that's, that's generated or that leaves the package? So that's a quick overview of my research. I'll hand it off to Professor Dong Dong to introduce himself.
Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dong Dong. I'm a system professor uh, working at CPAS. So these pages show me a show everybody a quick uh, background uh, of my uh, personal history. So I got a, a bachelor degree from Tsinghua University uh, in 2007, and then I came to uh, Virginia Tech and worked as a graduate student in CPAS. So I got my master and uh, PhD degrees. Uh, from 2007 all the way to uh, 2012. And my advisor was uh, Dr. Dushan Brojevic. So after graduating from the CPAS, I worked with uh, General Electric from 2012 to 2018. Basically, I worked as uh, R&D engineers over the years to support multiple G businesses as well as the government agencies. And uh, after 2018, I returned back to CPAS as a uh, assistant professor to continue the research. Uh, so this is kind of a brief background on myself. And then the next page basically show you the, the major research I'm working at at CPAS. Um, based on my uh, personal education and working experience at General Electric, uh, at CPAS right now, I'm working mostly on the high power applications. Uh, when I talk about high power, it's typically in a range of about like uh, kilowatts all the way to uh, multi-megawatt uh, power conversion systems. And the core uh, research uh, direction I'm uh, working on is uh, modular-based solutions and also the high-frequency uh, power conversions. So trying to use uh, web and guide devices like silicon carbide, silicon nitride devices operating the tens of kilohertz or even uh, hundreds of kilohertz or megahertz to significantly uh, enable a lot of benefits in the uh, converter level and system levels. And also to address these uh, high power areas, I'm trying to look for modular approach to really standardize uh, power conversion solutions for multiple different applications. So within these uh, uh, core research directions, um, as highlighted in these slides, I'm uh, showing you a few uh, sub-directions. The first one is these uh, medium voltage, high voltage, modular-based multi-level converters, mostly in the topology controls and applications. For example, the grid applications, um, uh, renewable energy uh, integrations, and transmission systems. And also working in uh, high densities, high frequency power supply solutions, uh, DCDC, ACDC, all kinds of different uh, applications. The goal is to really use these uh, uh, one band gap devices and other dielectric, magnetic, and the packaging materials integration solutions to push the power density as high as possible. And also on the other side, I'm working at uh, uh, circuit protections like uh, solid state hybrid circuit uh, breakers. Uh, gate drivers, sensing, uh, cooling systems to benefit the overall uh, power conversion systems. And the last one, I also work quite a lot of in these uh, high frequency, high power magnetics transformers and also the EMI builders. So my research also have a lot of collaborations with other CPAS faculties, for example, Dr. Rolando Bogus, Dr. Dushan Borjevic, and Dr. Richard Zhang. This page shows you several uh, units we built uh, within this area, including these uh, solid state transformers, uh, circuit breakers, uh, high voltage insulation power supplies, and also the multifunctional gate drivers, electric vehicle chargers, as well as the modular transformer uh, solutions. So this is kind of the, the background and also the research I'm currently working on. Also, this page show you a, a few examples of the industrial collaboration programs we work at CPAS. Uh, the, the first one is the modular multi-level converters. We are working together with G power, power conversion businesses for their uh, industrial drive and grid integration applications. The right hand side is another sponsored uh, programs that we work with Airbus to develop these uh, high density a high-speed propulsion drive system for the electric airplane applications. And the last one is the, uh, the unit we built in collaboration with Wasbeat to use their 10 kV sync color MOSFET to demonstrate this uh, medium voltage, high-density modular surface water unit for uh, PV applications. 
So really uh, looking forward to have more interaction with um, with you guys. And at this point, really looking for um, master and PhD students and uh, also visiting scholars and uh, postdocs. And uh, the desired background um, I'm looking for is uh, multi-level converters, uh, AC and DC converter topologies, uh, high frequency electronics, digital control backgrounds, and definitely um, if you have a hardware experience and hardware background, that will be extremely uh, desired. And after that, I'm gonna turn over to Professor Richard John. Thank you, Dundong. Um, window up. So hello, everybody again. Um, so for especially for folks uh, actually calling in from Asia, and appreciate that you stayed this this late. So I wanted to uh, kind of a little bit of talk about. Uh, I believe uh, what you probably care about uh, very importantly. Your mind. One quick quick question is: so uh, why why CPAS, right? Uh, I just want to share with you from my experience why I believe the CPAS is actually really one of the best places in the world because it's really, it, it's obviously it matters about what we do and how we're doing things today. But I believe more important also is what does that mean when you graduate from? Okay. So therefore, I'd like to share a little bit with you. And my answer to that is kind of a twofold. One is uh, really I go back to what our founder, uh, Dr. Fred Lee and Dr. Uh, Dushan Boruh said, uh, which I strongly resonated. Uh, what, what they said was the university research or CPAS is all about exploring new territory and new frontiers, right? So our job is really get to the cutting edge and pave the road for the industry. And also we do that, we're almost like an artist, right? Artists meaning that we're creating something new in a very elegant way. So that's kind of, in my view, sums up uh, what we do. And also another thing unique about the CPAS is CPAS actually provides a three ecosystem for everybody. But one ecosystem is, as you heard the many faculty member talking about, well, very covers very wide range of vertical research topics. And it's very, very rare in university environment that all the faculties are collaborating very closely together. So that's actually very, very beneficial and unique for all the students. And also the, the second ecosystem is actually students. Students actually, you heard many students talking about, they're actually learning from each other uh, in the diverse uh, research topics. So once you graduate from here, not only you, are, you should be excellent at what you do, but also you have a very wide coverage of this domain. And a third ecosystem is our closeness to industry, right? We have lots of industry members. They bring uh, different perspectives to guide our research, but also they actually directly reach out to our students and for the future careers. So with that setting the stage, I just want to share with you from my personal experience, right? Because I actually graduated from here 25 years ago and I joined the GE Global Research Center. And within you know less than three years, so two two and a half years, I became a manager, uh, leading the overall GE power electronic research for diverse range of GE industrial businesses, and then that, that prepared me to launch the next stage of my career, becoming executive leader in different types of business, old energy like oil and gas, and new energy uh, for building and designing the first GE wind converter for onshore and offshore wind and creating the programs and products for the world of first 1.5 kV solar converter, multi megawatts, and developing the medium voltage drive up to 100 megawatt class system. And then in the later future, it's uh, in the last few years, was developing the world first the two to four gigawatt offshore uh, uh, HVDC system for offshore wind pipeline. And also that future, you know, diverse industry setting, given the opportunity to really work with a diverse culture around the world. So I was working in China, working in Paris, working in the UK. So you actually have uh, CPAS is also uh, giving you that platform of global nature. We're extremely closely connected with all the top scholars in the world 
and uh, we're, we're collaborating uh, with them. So what's next? Uh, very simply, is really about uh, the, the reason why CPAS and, and the, my G experience taught me is in order to be great, and in order to be a leader for the future, you really wanted to think about what's coming around the corner. What does the world need? So what do we need? Well, obviously I would characterize that as a smaller IT and a big IT, right? Smaller IT as an information technology, as you heard the many faculties working on those power supplies for GPUs. The big IT is really the infrastructure technology, right? So the infrastructure that we have today built by the pioneers over 100 years ago, 140 years ago for electric grid. And they built it based on the technology that they knew at that time. And uh, Thomas Edison doesn't really know power electronics. So if he's going to actually create the infrastructure, Edison and Tesla in the room with us, the infrastructure will be very, very different, right? We're talking about a renewal, renewable energy like offshore wind, large solar farms, talking about uh, tying to the utility grid through high voltage DC, or actually build the completely new different grid, right? For the EV charging, uh, hydrogen production and so forth. So right now, uh, as you have heard a few times that we're actually doubling our facility in Arlington. And that's really geared towards growing this electrified green infrastructure power conversion. That's gonna stimulate a wide range of topics from the system to circuits, to control, to new applications, okay? So with that, um, I will stop sharing here and I'll hand it over to, I think who's, uh, uh, Richard, Charlie. thank you. Um, yep, yeah, go ahead. Yes, um, is that Chang Li or my, or Yu Hao? Sorry, I, I yep. lost the track. Well, it should be Yu Hao, but I'll yeah, Yu Hao. Yes. Okay, Yu Hao. Then I'll Yu Hao is still not in, so he asked me to present. If case is not there, I'll show you very quickly his content, and then Chang Liao, I can transfer to you. That's okay. Um, again, he's attending a meeting that he could not get out, so he will be joining the evening session. So uh, Yu Hao joined us in two thousand eighteen, after being a, a postdoc at MIT for a year, where he also obtained his PhD working on uh, GAN uh, semiconductor devices. So Yu Hao is an overall, he's addressing uh, power semiconductors from the physics and materials aspects, uh, all the way to device design, processing technologies, device prototyping as he's able to manufacture and test these devices. And then looking also into device manufacturing, robustness and reliability of the different semiconductors he's working on, gallium nitride, gallium oxide, as silicon carbide as well. And then going into the application range and developing package and circuits in collaboration with our CPS faculty. Um, so he has, uh, we've had prof semiconductor professors in the past, like Alex Wong, for instance, in the past. But uh, so you all joining us in 2018 really revitalized this area within the center. Um, in terms of capabilities, um, we do have uh, quite a, a, the ability to also manufacture these devices. So it's not just design and simulation, but really building and testing this, as I we mentioned, um, in terms of fabrication um, and the ability to process white bang of semiconductors. We have different, um, say, components in this whole uh, process chain from the deposition to lithography, etching, uh, dicing, so ex ex external um, uh, thermal oxidation furnaces, characterization of devices, et cetera. And then also the ability to characterize uh, on wafer um, up to 150 millimeter on wafer characterization using probe stations, um, assessing temperature, or testing them under different temperatures, et cetera. So the lab is fully equipped, uh, and our department is also fully equipped to develop these semiconductors, and that's the main, um, say, uh, the, the main uh, tools that UHO is working and leading his group of students to the development of these wide band gap, and now also looking to ultra wide band gap semiconductor devices. Uh, he's looking for PhD applicants and also postdocs going forward, but again, if you're really interested in working in this area, I suggest you join us in the evening session if you're able. Um, that will happen today today at 8 p.m. Eastern time in the US. All right, uh, thank you everyone. And I'll stop sharing now to let uh, Professor Chang Li go ahead. Okay, hello everyone, this is Chang Li. 
Okay, just a quick introduction about myself. So I also graduated from CPAS in the 2011. And before that, I received my master and a bachelor degree, both in Zhejiang University in China. And after I graduated, I, know I, I never left the CPAS. I just stayed here, start as the uh, assistant professor. Then right now I'm a full professor. And for my research interest, and basically there are three major applications. You can see the first one is high performance computing. It's, well, it's, it's a power supply for high performance computing application and also the power supply for data center. And this is a power supply for power converter for electric vehicle. And I'm doing lots of research in terms of high frequency power converter and high density integration, especially for this passive component, this transformer and inductor integration with PCB winding. And also we've, we're doing lots of research in this uh, EMI area, which are to have a special converter topology to minimize the EMI noise. And right now we have I'm gonna have opening for all these category, master student, PhD student, also including the postdoc. And any background, welcome. And here's some research highlight in in here in this area is about the data center and the high performance computing. So we are working from the AC DC converter, this PFC, and to the high voltage DC DC and to the low voltage DC DC. In all these example, you can see we integrate this transformer inductor with PCB winding, so we can realize high density at the same time with high efficiency. And we use in all these examples we're using guide nitro device. And we also collaborate with the this device faculty in the CPAS, like Professor Yu Hao Zhang, where I studied the reliability for the whole system from the device up to the system level. Okay, and for the electric vehicle, we're also doing lots of research in terms of this high density power converter. And here just give you an example. We have seven kilowatt bi-direction onboard charger and 11 kilowatt. And today we are working on even higher power with 22 kilowatt. And we are using this same carbide device in this project. We also put the frequency much higher compared to industry practice. And here is a few, another example about DC-DC converter. So inside this electric vehicle, we also have multiple DC-DC converter to conduct different battery system. And then we also can realize very high efficiency, high density by using this wideband gap device and also integrate the magnetic component. Okay, so that's just a quick summary for my research. And uh, as the next faculty is uh, Dr. Li Yanzhu. Hello. Hey, this is Lian, and uh, I'm a research scientist uh, joined the CPAS last year, and I work closely with Dr. Li Chang. So as a research scientist, actually, I cannot hear students, but I just want to introduce my personal affiliation and the experience with CPAS, and also introduce some of my previous research and also ongoing research as a complement to Dr. Chang's uh, introduction. So if you are interested, you can just go to Dr. Li Chang, and we can pro probably work together in the future. So for my work, uh, work uh, in my PhD career and here in CPAS, I mainly focus on the uh, integrated power electro units for electric vehicle application. So during my PhD career, I already uh, done something like uh, package integration and the topology integration, but that's not the all uh, if we want to uh, ambitious uh, 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 power electronics integration. Uh, so I just joined the CPAS to continue my work that's mainly focused on the magnet magnetics integration and also the system integration, uh, including the control and uh, all these kind of mechanical things uh, and some more things. So uh, for me, I think uh, one of the strengths, strengths of our CPAS is we have a very broad spectrum of the power electronic research. So no matter you already have a, a definite uh, uh, interest or you just the interest in the general power electronics and don't know what to do in the next, I think CPAX, you can always find a good fit here. And also, so for my own research, if you found it's interesting and you are uh, interested in this uh, power electronics for the electrical vehicle or this kind of integrated things, you can just uh, 
uh, come to Dr. Chang Li and uh, yeah, see uh, express your interest and uh, yeah, welcome to join us. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. And now we'll take you over now and share my screen once again. This one. All right, so I gave you a couple of slides about what I'm doing right now. And it's also background, general background. I'm originally from Chile, this long skinny country in South America, the Pacific coast. I'm right in the middle there in Concepcion where I also went to school and college in grad school. Um, graduating finally in 2002 with a PhD. At that point, I jumped to Blacksburg, became a postdoc here and then research scientist and assistant professor, research assistant professor in 2005. Uh, then I jumped to North Carolina uh, as, and joined the industry. And I was with ABB corporate research for three years um, working in the research center in Raleigh, North Carolina, but also quite a bit in the research center in Baden in Switzerland. Um, where I was primarily involved in uh, working on medium voltage power conversion within the APB uh, business units for modern drives. And then in, uh, also at that point, I became an adjunct associate professor at NC State University because it's located with a code located with APB really. So I had a chance to collaborate with professors at NC State. And then I came back in 2012 um, as an associate professor at CPES, then became professor in 2019 and then uh, we sucked the role with Dushan in 2021, and so I became the director at that point. Um, I'm currently working on, uh, let's say, a variety of topics, but the main, uh, say, the focus right now, I would say, is on medium voltage and high power applications, uh, where we've been working with Professor, uh, I don't know, mentioned Professor Dong, and also Borojevic, um, and then there's many of the research faculty that work with us in medium voltage power conversion using 10 kV MOSFETs, but also 3.3 kV, 1.7 kV, in the modular power conversion in general, uh, using this wide bank of semiconductors. This picture in the middle show a recent test of a converter we built in a similar flying capacitor type unit that's been developed for a DOE program. That's a one MBA system that can hook up directly to 13.8 kilovolts and generate also 22 kV DC bus. So this is some, some of the pictures we test for the first milestone. And that has allowed me to also see this in general to go more, more deeply into Installation system design, we've learned a lot. Uh, it's been a steep learning curve, but I think we've done, I'm very pleased all the work that has been conducted and we've been able to successfully test it and miss much or much higher voltages than we ever did in the past. And also that we've been able to apply to other circuit solutions like the solid state circuit breakers, for instance, that you see here, um, demonstrating um, an current interruption capability for a medium voltage DC bus. Um, also, I um, have quite a bit of interest in grid in general, or, or the power of grid as it's being transformed with integration of power electronics and more and more into an electronic energy system, as we'd like to call. And so this shows um, one of the tests we have is a silicon carbon converter that is being used primarily for the development of reforming inverter controls that we've been working on for a long time, actually. Uh, now going almost 10 years working on this topic. Um, and also, in, which is now being used to test the capability of using PV inverse to black start a whole system. So starting from obviously stepping a sequential process to from the PV farm to be able to reconnect the whole grid once a black uh, out event happens. Also, in the system level, we've been working to help Professor Borojevic and our faculty in the past as well, all the way going back to Professor Lee. Um, in the system and dynamic interactions that occur in power electronic systems, which used to be DC systems, then slowly we move down from air to aerospace and marine applications, as all those distribution systems are primarily formed by power electronics and power converters that are acting as source load and distribution equipment. And now the grid looks like that. So that background gave us a possibility to start working increasingly more into the grid and integration, especially now with all the renewables being um, connected and added on a daily basis. So we use what is called impedance-based um, stability criterion to, to analyze and, and, and really study the way the grid operates with this new power electronics. Um, I'm, uh, I love aviation in general, so I've had the, the, the I maybe I've been lucky enough to be able to work in many projects in aerospace power electronics, helping them become lighter, more compact in the development of the more electric aircraft, also automotive applications where we're always dealing with EMI. It's a key, say, battery for all the power electronics work that we do. And we, so we all of us really work on it quite strongly. 
uh, as well working on lower power systems of GAN devices, trying to push them to higher power applications or, or nonetheless working in, in you know, say small power supply units like this little brick that you see here is a two watt power supply uh, that is used as a um, uh, gate driver for GAN devices as well. We're now looking at exploring even the use of GAN devices for motor drives that are being used for uh, drone applications or maybe in the near future you'll have the packages delivered straight on your backyard uh, by some of our companies. Um, and with that, then what I'm uh, looking for from a position standpoint, what's on my radar right now, <laughs> really looking to hire and over the next cycle, uh, four students, PhD preferably, but also open to MS students that may have the right background or main or the right interest. Uh, also looking to hire a new postdoc and also visiting scholars, which could be PhD students or PhDs already or recent PhDs. Area of interest and the background of these students should be uh, by buying a base power converter design and control in general, circuit design and analysis for power, circ power and auxiliary circuitry, but someone who really enjoys working on circuits. Electromagnetic interference, EMI, installation system design, coordination, and towards the higher power end power system operations, uh, distribution and transmission level. So I've had several students that came from the power system background, and we continue working on that topic, but as they were, let's say, retrained or trained in power electronics, and so now they have, they master both areas, let's say. Uh, renewable energy integration, uh, generation and integration in general, and also digital control systems, both hardware and software sites. And that's also a key research area that we've had at CBIS for a long time. And we continue advancing this, uh, um, especially for higher power applications where it really become instrumental to be able to run these power converters uh, as a, one of the as mitigation schemes we have to deal with EMI. So with that, I think uh, we finished the overview of the CPS faculty. And now I have a short section to describe to you what are the um, positions and the terms of the offers we normally give our uh, students, um, student applicants. So these are the GRAs, postdocs, and visiting scholars. So the first one, I'll start with the terms for the master's and PhD graduate uh, research assistantships, or the GRAs as we call them. Um, this normally supports students for two and four years, or well, that's the main offer made. These are 12 month years, not the nine month academic years you may be familiar with for, for masters and PhD students. This is subject of course to a satisfactory work performance from the students on that's in you and also on the funding availability, which is on us naturally. But uh, fortunately, um, TPS as a center, we have a, a a, a great record and track record of more than four decades of continuous support of graduate students. As I mentioned before already several times, we graduated more than 400 students. So that's never been a problem. And as long as we keep working hard and advancing technology, I think we feel confident that that should not become a barrier to hire students. In regards to the stipend that students receive, this ranges from entry-level master students to senior-level PhD students. Um, it also depends on the location, whether you're in Blacksburg or in Arlington. Arlington is in a highly or, or a dense populated area, so the cost of living is different than in Blacksburg. And this is also adjusted annually uh, by Virginia Tech, the college, and ourselves to offset the cost of living if there's any change. Of it. And maybe recently that's been more of an issue, but we've been adjusting quite uh, I think well and dealing with this quite well. As an example, you see here the two ends of the spectrum, the, the entry level master's student, uh, the monthly stipend, and then what's it's the total annualized on the right column. Then you also have the PhD student who is a senior now, PhD student maybe close to graduation or year or year and a half out of graduation, who once he's passed his qualifying exam and also the preliminary exam that is uh, really presenting what he will be defending. Um, then there are some uh, um, possibilities, as you heard today in the lab tour, was conducted by our lab area leaders, and they receive an additional plus up on a monthly basis, and then the total annualized is shown here. We also have possibilities to become TAs for some of the courses that we at CBS faculty teach, and normally that's uh, an additional, um, let's say, additional amount on a monthly basis for the length of the semester. So per course, more or less, that will be additional extra. And in general, we, not in general, we do cover all the travel expenses and the conference registration for the conference attendance, assuming you're presenting a paper and that may be limited or not limited to depending on your own productivity. So if you have one or two papers or three papers a year and they're going to relevant conferences, you will be supported to attend them. Um, 
you because this is a 12 month contract you do get vacation time officially you have two weeks of paid vacation plus the days between christmas and new year's summer 25th and january 1st at the end of the year and also the contract covers your tuition fully uh, which changes every year but the tuition of virginia deck for this academic year is shown here eighteen thousand and forty four dollars um, the conditions for the postdocs and visiting scholars are, are slightly different. Um, just the nature of how it works. So in general, for the postdocs, the period is planned with the faculty or faculty advisor that is acting acting as a host uh, with you, working with you, your say supervisor or, or, or new advisor, however you want to view this. The main responsibilities are then to conduct and lead research um, personally, but also quite revising, co supervising the team of grad students normally. Could be one project or multiple projects as well. Then you will have responsibilities in terms of product, project management, publishing, conference attendance, workshop participation within the CPES, also within uh, when many times you attend workshop with the government, et cetera. So you're actively participating in developing your career potentially as a, a professor or faculty somewhere else. The salary in this case is planned with the faculty advisor, um, but there is a minimum, I'd say a, a bottom floor for this, so that is a control or determined by Virginia Tech, and that's the minimum per year that is uh, that it was just modified. So, and then for visiting scholars, these are um, say students or, or scholars coming here on a J1, which is an exchange visa. And the participants are then visiting graduate students, recent PhDs and visiting professors as well. So it, the work always and responsibility can fluctuate quite a bit. The period is also planned with the host faculty advisor, whoever you're working with within CPES, but it's normally in the range of six months to one to two years. Uh, that's a normal experience. Um, the responsibility again will be commensurate with the experience of the visitor, whether it's a student, a post, or a professor naturally it will be quite different. And, but the, one of the key goals is then to conduct research and grow grow the collaboration between CPES and all the this visiting scholar institution. Um, the salary again is planned with the faculty advisor. Many times these visiting scholars are self-funded because they have funds from their government or the company or the university to do these exchanges for a period of time. So that's all that may factor quite a bit. And with that then, uh, the last section today, we have a um, pictorial, just set of slides to show you a little bit more details about Blacksburg and the Arlington areas in Virginia. So you get a, a more comprehensive idea of where you are if you're not familiar with uh, Virginia and the mountains, uh, the east, the west where we are right now in Blacksburg, we're in, on, over on the Appalachian Mountains, so we're height or elevation a little bit higher. Um, it's about 2,650 uh, meters, 2,000 feet, 2,200 feet. Um, so we do get uh, snow sometimes. We just had a little bit of snow. This picture is not from this time. We had, that's a couple of years ago. We had a bigger snowstorm, so you can always go and play. Uh, the campus is, uh, as Joe mentioned, I think is a very beautiful campus located in, in, okay, in the, say, in the near River Valley um, in Southwest Virginia. Uh, it's a traditional architecture. You see some of these main buildings. Uh, these are engineering buildings. That's Burris Hall where the main administration sits. And it's a view of the drill field, which is located in some park um, that is located in the middle of the campus. And one side is mostly academic buildings. The other side has some facilities and also the dorms for all the undergraduate students. There are many things to do in Blacksburg besides just studying and working hard in the lab. Uh, it's very dynamic, many events uh, going on all the time. Uh, some of the key say, points of attraction are the center of, for the arts. You can see on the top left and the bottom right, uh, it's about 10 years old, the new uh, center for the arts is beautiful. Um, a beautiful facility, but we'll also host uh, on campus the Lane Stadium, which is the main uh, obviously stadium for football. And then also Casa Coliseum for basketball. If you like sports, maybe you know that Virginia Tech football uh, program is not doing so hot recently, but it's coming back slowly. But basketball on the other hand is doing really well. If you follow any college foot, any college basketball in the US, you may have heard, but especially the girls team, the women's team is doing really well over the past couple of years. So it's a lot of fun and know most of these events you get to participate, but there's many much, much more than all this. Also, um, in general, um, on campus, uh, you can find great food. Uh, there's also a possibility to do, to do great exercise and great outdoors too, in general. 
so it's an interesting combination. That's always been a question because Virginia Tech has been awarded many times the best college food in America. So the dining services, dining program at Virginia Tech is great. You can really eat really well. Of course, you can eat at home too. I don't eat here, but I bring my own food, but the possibility for students are really endless. I think it's 49 different restaurants and multiple dining halls. It's, it's really amazing. But at the same time, it's been awarded many times uh, the most, the healthiest college campus in the nation. This is now as recent as 2022, and also as many times, twice now, uh, been named the fittest college in America by the active time. So although we have really good food, everyone really likes how working out a lot and exercising so people can stay healthy, which is very important. So it's an outdoorsy region here, a lot of hiking and biking. Uh, around the mountain and local mountains and many things and activities to do. So if you join, you will not be bored. Uh, you have many, many things to do. So I hope you enjoy this. You can kind of enjoy this in the future. And now I'll stop and let uh, Professor De Marino continue. Um, I want to stop my sharing. And then Christina can carry on presenting Arlington. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, so hello again. So uh, I'm uh, Christine DiMarino. I'm based in the Arlington location at CPES. I've been here for about five years now, um, kind of when we started to first establish the new CPES labs in Arlington. Um, Arlington is just a couple miles, about one kilometer or so from Washington, D.C. Um, so I'll talk a little bit um, first about Virginia Tech's presence in uh, the DC metro area, we're in one of several buildings that Virginia Tech has in this area, and Virginia Tech has actually had a footprint in this area for about 50 years. Um, so I won't talk about all the buildings, um, but I will highlight the kind of latest kind of expansion that Virginia Tech is having in the Northern Virginia area. So this is uh, very close to our where the CPES building is. It's about a 15 minute drive. Um, so this is a new campus that Virginia Tech is building um, in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and this was done in collaboration uh, with the kind of educational workforce development for the Amazon second headquarters that is also located in this region. Um, and so we're going to significantly expand our graduate representation in this area, particularly in electrical uh, and computer engineering and computer science. So the first building, this one that looks kind of like a gem, will be open uh, next year. And then they're planning several other buildings after that as well. So where CPES is located, we're at the Virginia Tech Research Center. So this is what that building looks like. So this is owned by Virginia Tech um, and has seven floors, all Virginia Tech. Uh, it opened about uh, just over 10 years ago. Uh, it is not just electrical engineering it, and not just College of Engineering. It actually features a wide variety of the colleges and departments within the university. Um, specifically for electrical and computer engineering, there are actually 20 ECE faculty based in this location. Um, and we also have a variety of alumni and student events that we host here um, and event and conference rooms as well. Uh, so you saw the CPES labs already that we have located here. Um, just a few kind of um, numbers. So roughly speaking, three quarters of CPES is located in Arlington, or sorry, three quarters of CPES is located in Blacksburg at the Virginia Tech main campus, roughly one quarter in Arlington. So we have about two faculty, myself and Richard Zhang and the Dushan Borovich also spend some of his time here as well. We have uh, around between 15 and 20 graduate students, depending on the year. Um, and we also have a variety of internship programs that we offer. Um, many different projects. Um, we really are focusing on really trying to leverage this location. We're very close to a bunch of government funding agencies for research. We're next to a bunch of national labs um, and a lot of industry in this area. Um, and so we are really focused on trying to leverage that. So a lot of our sponsors for the projects that are located here are going to be local. And that just allows for a deeper collaboration and interaction with them. We also do teach some power electronic courses from this location as well. And we have about 4,000 square feet of space. Um, and we opened right before the pandemic, so that has not helped. But um, since 2019, when we opened our first lab, we've hosted a number of CPES events and also tours for the Board of Visitors at Virginia Tech. Um, as well as um, participating in local outreach activities um, and uh, research program reviews, workshops for uh, with government agencies, things like that. And we get a lot of visitors as they also do in Blacksburg as well. 
So that's kind of quick overview of CPEZ in the DC metro area. All right, thank you, Christina. And I think with that, we are, let me share the screen now. Now we've finished all the presentations and um, showcasing all the facilities and everything we're doing at CPACE. So it's now it's the time for open questions um, that you may have. We've had a few in the, in the Q and A box, we answered them, but now um, let's say, let me go. You can interact through Zoom directly. And if you would like to ask a question directly, you can raise your hand. We will then mute you at this point. So you can speak and we can hear you. You can ask your question or you can ask the question directly in the Q&A box as you, some of you did already. So um, I would like everyone now, if all the professors that you can unmute yourself and connect your videos again, so we can answer the questions that may come through. We can start maybe with the questions that are already posted. Um, oh, the, the one here by uh, Nahid Islam. So it says that why, oh, when will the decisions of Virginia Tech be released? Um, there's not a fixed date, um, but as we say, once we establish contact with the students, um, we will reach out to you and, and talk and discuss. If we come to an agreement, then we, at that point, we will issue an offer letter. Uh, and then you will have a deadline, which I believe is beginning of April to respond to see if you accept the offer that we're making or not. So the deadline is truly is the acceptance of the um, offer letter once you receive it. But before that, you will be contacted or by the professors once they see your application in the system and they, if you, um, which is a normal process, I would say. Um, there's a second question by Hamoud. Uh, says, um, what's the mentoring procedure to train newly enrolled grad students? Um, do they get prior training, for instance, on high power converters before getting fully involved in the field? And I can answer that, but maybe someone else would like to share that. Your experience, how do you train the new students as they're coming in? Dong, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, yeah. Just share my my experience here. So I think the most training is actually from the peers, other students, senior students, because I think right now we have a, uh, you know, more than eighty students working together in the lab. So I will see that's most of the training experience the new student will have. They can directly talk with the other senior students. Um, to learn the, the fields they are working on. And for the high power areas, usually we not allow, allow the new student to directly work on it themselves. We always work in a group, for example, two or three students uh, working together uh, to do particularly the high power test. And through that um, process, new students are gonna learn how to, for example, perform the test, uh, safety requirements, uh, instrumentations and um, you know measurement. We also have um, a lot of lab procedures to follow, uh, so the new student can quickly learn through these uh, procedures, uh, trainings uh, to gain experience, um, especially in the high power. Area. And definitely, uh, faculty are gonna highly involved in the project meetings, personal meetings. To have more direct in, uh, interactions with the new student regarding the project and uh, research topics. Um, I will see the most uh, unique advantage of CPAS compared to other places is uh, we have so many students. Any topic you can find a student student who are expert over there in that field. For example, Yama, you can always find some student know Yama quite a lot. So I think that's a very big benefit, learning experience. Yeah. Thank you, Don. And if I can add just a little yeah. bit on the formal thing, when a new student comes, he will in the first week meet with his um, um, tentative advisor, advisor who has made him an offer. 
and then uh, they will go over the process that of this question. And the first thing will be actually going selecting the courses. So there is quite a bit of preparation for the general topic by through the regular courses that you will take at Virginia Tech, where you will learn a lot of background uh, before you actually start doing the research. The second point, you will be immediately assigned to a specific project, which may not be your dissertation uh, area, but maybe something that you are interested, uh, that there is a need, and that could be potentially your topic. So that's where you will get immediately involved with the graduate students on that project, working on the same project, and that's what Dong described. From them, you will learn. And in addition to this, also formally, we have the short courses on um, procedures and safety and things like that, and both for the packaging where you can have deal with the many dangerous chemicals or high power where you deal with the dangerous voltages or currents. There are courses that you have to take before you can do it to participate in this. But these are short. You can complete any of these courses online in about a week or so, <clears throat> and then take a test. And once you pass the test, you will have access to all these facilities. So there is a structured process. As soon as you come, you'll get involved in all of these at the same time, and you will not be alone after the first week. So there will be always somebody to help you. Thank you, Dushan. Hamoud, that was your question. You're, you're allowed to unmute yourself if you want to follow up on that. Yeah, I, I've got a small question over here. So my question is about the guideline for new students that uh, solely work on a certain project. Does he get any guideline that divides the project into small milestones or it's uh, solely up to him to divide the project into small tasks? Well, good. Uh, I'm not sure I've understood the question You're saying that if the, the project is, is the initiative of the student or you're joining an existing project? Yeah, for example, uh, I'm assigned a project that works on module level packaging and I'm the only student that, for, for instance, I work on module level packaging. So am I supposed to uh, work independently on this task or I will get some kind of small task that will finally lead to this project? I mean, well, I, uh, I yeah. Yes, I think this is what, like Dr. Dong mentioned and Borovich also that you, when you join, you will not be left to your own devices. You will not be by yourself. That's definitely the case. And if you're joining a project, then you will be paired or teamed up with a more senior student for sure. And then you'll be able to work with him, and you will slowly get involved and start learning because you're taking courses, you're participating in the lab, you're starting to help in the experiments, and then slowly taking a, a small task within the project, and then you slowly grow. At some point, you will be more senior, and maybe the second year, then you'll be the senior, or third year, you'll be in that position, and you'll be helping new students, and then you'll take a bigger, say, portion of that project, or the new project, or the continuation of that project, etc. So it's really a, a gradual learning uh, process um, for all new students. No one is just drops that. For course, postdocs may be different, correct? Or even PhD students that already have experience in masters, but they still come as a new environment, new culture, and how things work here. So they also oh, they're always paired with someone who's more senior. In case of PhD student, maybe paired with a working directly with a research faculty or a postdoc already, etc. So it's always a team environment. And what is key in this, as Professor Dong mentioned, I would like to reiterate that is the peer-to-peer the -peer training that happens because it's so open and the, the ability that we have to share information between all the students, that's the main mechanism that you'll have to learn because not, not just from by asking questions, but if you need to use a new code for a modulator, for instance, you don't have to sit down and type and, and program it yourself. You can just borrow it and learn it and then use it. And like that, many, many, many different tools and that you can just take and take and learn and use much faster. So that allows us to move our own research as an enterprise in a much faster dynamic that if you were by yourself sitting in a lab where you need to do everything from scratch and learn everything yourself, it's really hard. And that also maybe gives you the possibility to become specialized in a, in a subtopic, let's say faster than if you were in another school. If it's EMI, if it's digital controls or in packaging aspect, different aspects of the, of the construction, the module, the characterization of devices, et cetera, you can more, you can uh, faster become an expert in that topic because you're collaborating with our uh, people in your project or within the center that can help you um, 
basically it's, you can view it as a distribution of labor. We have more people, so we can distribute the tasks very well. Then you can allow that allows you to develop faster as well. But yeah, well, just for yourself, you don't have an option. <laughs> yes. Just, just to put it very simple, there are practically no single per single student projects. All our projects are team projects. There are some exceptions occasionally, and these are usually reserved just for very senior PhD students. All yeah. the others work on team projects, so you will never be alone. Thank you so much. I just got a small another question. So in case we want to reach out to professor, are we supposed to directly reach out to professor or just apply and submit our application? Well, you, if the requirement is to apply to Virginia Tech, so you, that has to be done. Then yeah. in the application, you can mention that also, whether it's your statement, research statement, or an actual the, the application process, that you can see, click the box for this or that professor. But then also direct contact to the, to the professor you're interested in working with would be, would be very helpful because then I hear, oh, okay, you want to work with me, then I can check your application and et cetera, establish that contact. But maybe mentioning that you, if you email someone, mention that you applied and that you put that you would like to work with this person. So then, because the, the honest truth is that we get many, many emails and from students around the world. And, and in the end, it's, it's a, basically being bombarded by hundreds of emails. So it's very hard to find it. So if you are very specific and mention that, I think would be great. Also, if you're doing that uh, and you're, really committed in your mind to try to join CPES, it would help also maybe you can, we can discuss with Dennis, but we can reach out to the, to our website directly. And that maybe uh, Dennis could be a good contact for that, but we'll, we can maybe share that after the, I'm just improvising right now, how else to get in touch with us. Um, but yeah, the application to Virginia Tech is absolutely required to be able to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all also, the CPES yeah. faculty. Yeah, when you join directly, you can reach out to you don't have a, as Dr. Burgos mentioned, apply and submit all the required documents there. You don't need to send those same documents to the professor you reach out. Just say, okay, I applied there and my application number or name is this and this and finish with that. If you have some specific document or something else, a paper you published that was not possible to submit there, then it could be good to include that as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. Anyway, our hand raised. No, but we have um, a question by, um, well, I'm not sure if typed correctly, um, but it's a question on the requirements for visiting scholars. Dushan, maybe you want to comment on that? Any specific requirements on visiting scholars? No. Uh, I mean, uh, really, when it's visiting scholar, that, uh, well, there are two types. One is, uh, visiting scholars that are already students, full-time students somewhere else. So they are either masters, occasionally even undergraduate, but masters and PhD students somewhere else. And then in their program, there is a plan or a desire that they spend a part of their study at another university. So that those visiting scholars that come here is uh, something that is regularly expected. Um, and uh, they are relatively easier to get a position here because very often with their plan of spending part of their program, uh, actually much of the funding for that is provided by the host, by their original institution where they're doing their PhD and so forth. So in that case, really main requirement is, is their area of interest and expertise uh, paralleling somebody's work here. And we may not have even specific funding or we could have partial, but the other part of the funding is provided by the visiting scholars organization. So that's the visiting scholars that are students elsewhere and come here to spend a little bit of time. Little bit of time means one semester or two semesters kind of, that's the normal range. Now there are other types of visiting scholars, which is actually who are professors somewhere else or they work in industry and so forth. And those are different. Um, really, the interest there is that there is some uh, compatibility uh, with what we are doing. So something that is similar to what we do, or sometimes uh, actually we can hire visiting scholars to, from whom we will learn, expand into new areas. I just give an example, 10 years ago, we decided we need to do something in a high voltage. 
and high voltage meaning exceeding uh, tens of thousands of volts into hundreds of thousands of volts, which we didn't have experience. So we actually had a series of two or three visiting scholars who came and spent with us half a year or a year who are professors in high voltage, not in power electronics, but in high voltage elsewhere around the world. And then they came as visiting scholars. In that case, we sponsored part of their um, uh, costs and expenses here because that was of interest to us and so forth. So it's a much more flexible, much more open. And since there is no formal process, there is on CPAS website, but not on the Virginia Tech side. That is essential to contact specific professor you think you would like to be and try to establish a contract through a series uh, of emails initially. Because if you don't establish that, that will not work. Another great opportunity if, is if you are attending any of the professional conferences, uh, actually reaching out and meeting that professor in person after your presentation or similar, and then discuss with them that you have those plans year from now, half a year from now, why and how. The last point is visiting scholars from our 80 companies in our industrial consortium. They could also come and uh, that can be, uh, they, uh, in, they have a, a priority. If their company says, yes, we want that and that person to spend one month or one year and we will cover their salary, but they will work in your lab. Uh, that is uh, something that's almost guaranteed to be done if that company is a member of CPAS, a consortium. Yeah, thank you. I think that address, addresses the second or the next question about industry visiting scholars. Thank you, Dushan. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question in the, are you still working on Convert for space applications? Um, yes, so actively, I think. Um, different faculty at CPES. So that's one of our areas of, well, within transportation, let's say. <laughs> Um, yes, and we are also at the new faculty that we are hiring that will start in fall is specifically for space applications. So we are still working and we want to make it even stronger back as it was 20 years ago. So really, yeah. yes, very much focused on that. Correct. Thank you. Um, yes, well, I think the, during the presentation, the um, faculty posted well, that were the interest in hiring for this year, and several of us indicated postdoc as well. Um, so it's not posted on the website, but we may do that. Um, I think that's a good point, a good suggestion by Ashik. I mean, thank you. And Ashik was also asking about the presentation um, to be shared. I think uh, we need to find how to share it. Um, but uh, we had previously discussed that most likely we would be doing that. The slides. Um, these are all public materials, so we'll be able to share that later. So we'll post that on the website or reach out directly to the people who attended the, the um, open house. So thank you. And there is a brief discussion. Should there be a question? Should there be an agreement between two universities for visiting PhD scholars? No. If there is one, then usually the process is a little bit shorter. But this is really just administration. It's really not necessary if the scholar and the professor uh, agree that that would be useful, that's enough. They will make it work. If there is an agreement, then it could be done, you know, in one month of coordination, if there isn't two months of coordination, but that's it. Yeah. Um, Anurup, I'll, you have, uh, you're able to unmute yourself, but maybe you already answered your question. So if you would like to speak now, you can go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh... For students like uh, who want to pursue an internship uh, for a period of time, uh, who are already graduated, maybe with a MSW degree, uh, unpaid or paid, uh, how is it possible to pursue an internship or co-op uh, or some kind of part-time job uh, with the uh, CPS? It, it might be part-time part -time or also full-time as well. Uh, well, I would say first that the ninety-nine percent of our students are full-time students, but we do have a couple of students that are part-time and working in the industry right now. So it is possible. Um, it is hard work, of course, but that's your personal choice. In terms of internships, yeah, our students know 
I would say maybe half hour students go on internships throughout their studies and they spend the summer or sometimes throughout the year um, as well, uh, working in different companies. So it, most of them are CPES members, but sometimes it's also it could be a national lab or a company like not really a uh, member of CPES. So we're open to that as well. Um, it just needs to be planned and coordinated well so that the student's uh, research plan is not disrupted and hopefully something that is related to what he's doing, obviously. So then that can be uh, viewed as a say, expansion or, or, or strengthening the body of his research. Um, but yeah, many of our students end up going to internships and sometimes that in, uh, ends up being also the, the company that finally hires them when they graduate. So, oh, I was asking about the internships under uh, the professors at CPS, like uh, who are already graduated. Uh, that might be a paid or unpaid internship to, to gain some practical experience. Uh, Oh, okay. I misunderstood. Um, well, maybe what is um, can comment on that. So, um, so we have done that in the past. Uh, I actually did that when I first started at CPES. Um, uh, so it, it is possible. We usually do that when um, we're planning to hire the student, though. So we're planning to hire the student, but they're available. You know, we're planning to hire them as a GRA in the fall, but they're available in the summer and can kind of help get them up to speed, familiar with CPES and stuff over the summer before their coursework starts in the fall. Um, so we have done that. There are, the, usually that's restricted more towards US citizens because then we don't have to deal with as much visa challenges. So it's hard for us to do that for international students. That's the only thing. Yeah, for my case, it's like uh, I'm already a uh, MSW graduate uh, uh, presently in US. Uh, it gives me leverage uh, if I can have a uh, internship uh, opportunity with CPES, for example. Uh, like like me, there are more students uh, who can get uh, hands-on and uh, get experience with the professors and uh, uh, mostly land up with the PhD option, uh, uh, something like that. But I would than... just like to add to that depends what you do. We will hire somebody part-time for internship to do kind of a standard engineering work. If it is any research, we prefer something that's academic. So it's either a postdoc or a visiting scholar. So, and then also for the visa point of view, that also simplifies the things. Because yeah, that's either, you know, student or the exchange visitor visas and not the working visas. But even for part-time working visa, we need a part-time working position. We need working visas for international ones. And we, we really don't do that that much. We have, a, we would like to have people involved with us, even for shorter term, if they work with uh, some academic uh, responsibilities, not just, you know, help uh, maintain the lab or maintain the software and stuff like that. Although these would be traditional internships that we would do, but, uh, um, we don't have that too many of those. Yeah. And these are but publicized very differently. They are publicized as the jobs VTEDU when we are looking for part-time positions. But there is definitely opportunity for full-time positions. Uh, well, even for full-time. Yeah, we'll look occasionally. But let's say every 10 years, we'll look for one. And for graduate students uh, and visiting scholars and postdocs, every year we look for TED. So it's you know hundred to one difference. Thank you for answering. All right, thank you, Rob. And maybe the last question before we. Oh, oh Christina answered the question. Oh, sorry. Good. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> that one was. You, you might want to. Answer that one orally though. That one was hard for me to type out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the question was about daily, what do our students do on a daily basis? And how is that different from, from being in a company? Do you wanna go ahead, Christina? Sure, I was just saying that it, it changes day by day. Um, you know, it's not gonna be the same task every day, depending on where the student is in their research and the like what tasks they're working on for their particular project. 
They could be, you know, writing a paper if they just got a bunch of results, or um, and maybe they're working on presentations for an upcoming, you know, conference presentation or meeting or something like that, or presentation to the sponsor. Maybe they're working on simulations or analytical um, um, event and theoretical kind of studies, or maybe they're, you know, at the prototyping stage and then they're just, you know, doing hardware all day, every day, trying to get hardware results. So it really varies from day to day. I'm not sure if that captured what the question was asking. But uh, I would add, uh, uh, we don't uh, uh, micromanage you. Very rarely you have uh, daily assignments for tomorrow you need to do this and the day after that. And these are usually something organizational. When we are organizing a conference or something, then you have to do something tomorrow to happen. Like for this one, we had assignment to the students uh, that they have to host you today, and that cannot be yes to yesterday or tomorrow. They must have done it today. But that's the type of the thing. On the research and educational part, you mostly have expectations, not that much critical assignments, and they're usually on a weekly basis. Practically, you meet with your advisor or within your project every week. And on that every week, uh, you will have to report what did you do previous week, and where are you now? And what are what's your you know how much you advance? And ask questions. So what shall I do next? I'm thinking of doing this. It's real initiative is mostly on your time, on your side. But um, you will be guided weekly, and the expectations are weekly. How you do that? Do you sleep the whole week and then work uh, 48 hours before the project meeting, or you work you know six hours every? every day before, and then you come to a project meeting, that depends on personalities. And we have both cases. Some people work regularly, some work just uh, night and day before, but still, but that's a uh, fit your schedule. It's really more what you do and assignments are on a weekly or longer basis. Even on top of that, I may want to add to that. I, I think fundamentally to me, is the, 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 the nature of this too is totally different, even though, it may appear you're doing some design work, right? In the lab or working with other, on the surface, it may appear, okay, it looks like a similar, so what's the difference? I would say it's a huge difference because the purpose is totally different in nature. As a student, you are doing this for the purpose of learning and growing yourself to become a true professional eventually. What it means is, you know, in addition to the freedom that uh, Professor Borovich mentioned, there's also, okay, you, the failure is expected as long as it's not obviously stupid because you didn't really learn or follow. And then what's expected, I would say, is a progress, the steady and the speed of the progress along the way. And it's really for your benefit to learn, to become a professional, even if you are actually doing the design. It's part of the education and learning, as opposed to in the company. <laughs> You are expected to actually know the stuff you're supposed to design. If it's really failed, that's really a surprise. And you better not to surprise too many times. Otherwise, you're probably not going to survive. That's, that's, to me, it's a huge difference. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Richard. And maybe just add, the, from a logistical standpoint, the lab is open 24-7. So some people like to work at night. Some people like to work in the morning. It's all different. Meetings in general uh, with advice or the project meetings are conducted in normal business hours, let's say from 8 to 5, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, but then after that, how you manage your time is really up to the individual, um, however they want to work. So uh, and let me make course, you have your classes, but your course that you need to attend to naturally. But. And let me make a joke. Uh, you compared to industry, you're expected to work many more hours and much harder than the industry and you are paid a hundred times less, not hundred times, but five times less. So you work harder, but the big point here is because you're a graduate student and because you're seeking new knowledge, your big motivation is your curiosity. So that you, know, you really would like to do this if to figure it out, will it work, will it not? And that's a great motivation together with the guidance uh, by people around you. Uh, and, you know, how you're fine. we will support you financially to satisfy your goals and your curiosity. Uh, but the, yes, you will not be compensated anything comparable in the industry. So that's a huge difference, but that's what you want to do. And um, that's what we all together enjoy. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you. Um, I think we're a little bit over the time right now. So I would just like to, let me share the screen again. If I missed, I missed the screen. I would like to thank all the attendees, um, all the faculty, all the students who participated today and everyone at, at CIPES and again, everyone who joined us this in this session. Uh, and a reminder as well that if you have any questions, you can follow up directly through emails uh, to the professors or to a, anyone else within CIPES. And that we will have a second session this evening starting at 8 p.m. Eastern time. That's again, UTC minus five. So one, uh, that would be 1 a.m. UTC. Um, um, and again, thank you everyone for, uh, we hope this has been um, informative and entertaining at the same time and that you got a good picture of everything that CIPES is and what CIPES does uh, through all of us and all our students. So we hope to maybe see you in the future. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.